Can anybody? Good morning, everyone. We're going to start. Okay. Everyone could take their seats. Hi. So far, it's good, right? Yeah. I right. inches last night of coffee. I thought my head was going to explode right over my neck. I was like, I don't know, my editor's like, when's your ETA? I didn't even get home until quarter to five. Okay. And I didn't stay. I had to write and file. I filed that sucker by seven o'clock. You're awesome. Then I had this huge glass of gin. Because I just. Oh, you had to. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Amelia. Have a seat. We're going to start. Looks like a few people went out last night and continued the conversation, huh?
Grover, are you laughing at my joke? <coughs> no, too bad. So, you good? Kathy, Kathy's taping the floor. Um, welcome, everybody. Good morning. And um, just want to mention we have an, uh, an addition to the group here. Um, Rhode Island NPR is, um, has a mic on the table, just so you know. Okay? So, so last night, I got a little bit, I got home a little bit later than I thought I was going to. Um, the reception was pretty good. Food was pretty good. The, somebody even bought me a drink, so that was, that was nice. Um, so I got home. I had to help my son with his math homework. Algebra is pretty tough nowadays. I can't remember that. And I listened to my daughter complain about her science teacher and how she really wasn't learning a lot. Um, some of you may remember she was she came to our last event and was running up and down doing the roaming mic so I think she missed doing that um, so finally as probably a lot of you know when you go home everyone's telling about you about their day and their problems and their concerns finally they got around to saying so what did you do today you know and I'm like, oh, that's right, you had that big event you're organizing. And um, so they asked me, what did I learn? What, what happened during that day? So um, I didn't tell them all of this stuff, but this is, this is sort of what came out. I learned that probably offshore wind development was here to stay, that this was going to be our new reality, whether we like it or not that the reason why the Block Island Wind Farm was a success or is a success and is continuing is for three, th three reasons. One, that the project was small. It's a pilot project. That the ocean sand process facilitated basically a pre-permitting process that engaged stakeholders, the best available science, and it built trust and that the Block Island community benefited from this effort. And that those lessons learned should be applied as we move forward with the development of this, um, this new industry. We learned that although the Block Island wind farm has not, does not seem to have significantly impacted fish or marine mammals during the construction and operation, that there are still significant questions about the effects um, of, of these species when we're going to have hundreds of these wind turbines out there. That there'll be no buffer zones, no, Ed LeBlanc said, around these structures, except for during construction. And that these wind farms will not displace navigation or cause a threat to safety if he has something to do with it. That moving forward, it'd be a good idea to develop a shared cable corridor to potentially minimize the impact effects of electromagnetic fields. That that's a good idea. And that cumulative impacts are really on our minds still. And from day one, we've been wondering about cumulative impacts. And still, we don't really have a lot of good information about cum cumulative impacts. However, there's things that we can do about that. We can expand our baseline information and understand what, this, what everybody, what everything's doing out there now, individually, but also within the context of the ecosystem. We need to share and agree on methods and protocols for collecting data and that we need to define our region. One, one of us defined the region from Florida to Labrador, and that we, used, we need to use the same methods throughout that entire region to ensure that we're collecting the same data and so that, that we can compare it. We need this information for that reason, to make better decisions from a regulatory perspective, from industry. We also need to make it because what happens if we have those turbines out there and something bad happens and everyone's going to blame it on the wind turbines, we can at least maybe say, well, maybe it wasn't the wind turbines. Maybe it was increased temperature. 
Maybe it was something else, but we need to at least have that information to understand why things are taking place out there. And it may be the re it may be because of the wind turbines, but it may not be because of the wind turbines too. So <clears throat> we know in our gut that we really want a thriving commercial fishing industry. We really do, in our gut, okay? We care about the commercial fishing industry. We care about the recreational fishing industry as well. We care about it because it's part of our culture. It's part of who we are in New England. And we, we really, you know, without, we really want it to thrive. We really want the commercial industry to be here. But we also want, we, and, and we want it because we also like to eat seafood, okay? We like to eat food, and it's renewable protein, okay? So we have the balance between renewable protein and renewable energy. And how do we balance that? How do we get all of that out there? We also recognize that the fishing industry, although, although we're supposed to be managing these waters, okay, for the benefit of everyone, we realize that we have renewable energy, which we need, and we want renewable protein, which we want too. So how do we balance that to benefit society? But also, these are two businesses, and they are in it for the money as well as making the world a better place. So we really need to recognize that these are two industries and that if there are opportunities for either of these industries to benefit, whether it be to build their capacity or build their bottom line, then, then there's, there's something there. And that we should, and that the, the businesses, the industries, should talk and need to talk directly to each other to see maybe there are ways of managing that resource jointly to benefit both industries. And again, recognizing though, that this is, this is our resource, this is the community's resource, and that regulators need to be a part of the discussion. But again, maybe there needs to be you know, um, more direct relationships between the, those entities. We talked a lot about communication, and that there need, again, there needed to be communication amongst the businesses, but that also, we needed to have some sort of clearinghouse or a trusted entity that if there was an issue going on or that that, that, that entity would either step in and say, hey, this is what's going on based on the, the best available science or that that entity could come and help serve to communicate what's going on. When I was over, over there having my glass of wine, someone mentioned maybe we need a Congress of fishermen uh, made up of fishermen, maybe, maybe we need, but maybe we need to think about um, what's going on in Europe. Look at the European model of bringing the different fishing ports and the fishing entities around to ensure that there's communication. And communication, again, not only just for the business, but also to say, hey, this is what this company's doing today. This is what that company's doing today. So lots of reasons for communication. So, again, process was really important. Trust, a trusted process is really important, as well as science. So, um, so my daughter said, well, Mom, it sounds like you need to keep meeting with these people. Okay? Keep, you, did you figure anything out? Okay? I think, I think we've had some techniques. Okay? We've had the techniques where, you know, again, the fact that I look at Sue Tuxbury and there's going to be all of this activity going on. How is she going to effectively manage that? But then you hear Julia Livermore saying, well, Deep Water Wind paid for, you know, some of my time to do that. So I think we've identified some techniques. Um, that we need to continue to look for it, um, whether they be right or wrong. I think we need to consider safety and navigation um, to ensure that that will not be compensated. Um, so again, I agree with my daughter. I think we need to meet, meet again. We need to keep meeting like this and to continue the conversation amongst all of us. So 
that's what I got out of yesterday. Um, I hope that was a good summary. Does anyone have anything to add or to clarify? Yeah? Thank you, Matt. And, and recognizing the value and importance of the recreational community and, and just and the regular community. I think um, one thing that we heard yesterday about the benefits, you know, we were talking about what the benefit of the Block Island Wind Farm were, the fact that um, it's, sil it's quieter over on Block Island now because of the generators. There's, there's no generators and or, or fewer, they're using it less. And um, we did hear about the recreational community as well, and I think we're going to hear more about that today. So, so very good point. Anything else you'd like to add? Yep. Bill. Okay, so add aquaculture to the group. Aqu I say aquaculture, is that okay? Okay, good. Oh, well, you know, I'm from Tiverton. <laughs> Tiverton. Okay, great. So we're going to start the day. Um, we have the Habitat group. So Chris McGuire is going to come down and introduce the um, people on that panel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I think we're all set. Thanks, Jen. Um, uh, I'm Chris McGuire, and I work for the Nature Conservancy up in Massachusetts. Um, uh, most of the time, I spend my time working with commercial fishermen to try and figure out how we could work together to improve the um, information used for science and management. So this is not a, a big departure from that. Also, like a lot of people in the audience, I participate and uh, serve on a number of different advisory panels. And, uh, and one of them is um, with the New England Fisheries Management Council, uh, has a habitat advisory panel that I I'm currently the chair of, and you know that counts. That panel is designed to help give advice to managers um, about uh, habitat actions that are going through the council process, which is not really that different than what we're doing today. Um, you know, here we're trying to uh, work with different um, specialties, and today we're you know this panel is about habitat. So we're going to talk about uh, some of the lessons learned, and um, with our expert panel here, begin to share some information that hopefully wind industry uh, participants will use to help make good decisions about habitat. So um, with that, I'd just like to introduce our panel. Uh, some of these are um, frequent flyers uh, in this conference already. Uh, so um, first we have uh, Drew Carey, who's, uh, as you heard yesterday, a principal with Inspire uh, Environmental. Um, we have uh, Monique uh, LaFrance Bartley, who's uh, from right here at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. Kevin Stokesbury, um, professor at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth School of Marine Science and Technology. And uh, again, Sue Tuxbury, a fisheries biologist with uh, NOAA Fisheries. So as we did yesterday, each of the panelists will uh, give a short talk um, about the work that they've done or, uh, or how they see um, this fitting in the future. 
and then we'll have plenty of time for all of your questions, so please uh, think of them. I think we'll start with you, Drew. Thank you. Oh, and I hear I have a device for you. All right, thank you, uh, Chris, and thanks those of you who uh, chose to come back today and show up this early. Um, we're going to go back down to the seafloor. I'm going to focus uh, quite narrowly on the Block Island wind farm in terms of what we've been doing there, what we've understood from that, and then I think the other speakers ha will sort of move out to a broader, uh, more regional perspective. So. I'm going to talk about three different uh, studies that we've done, uh, but I do want to draw your attention to this one image up here. Uh, I think most of us would agree, just at glancing at this, that this is a what we would consider a high-value uh, benthic habitat. So there's a lot of diversity that you can see in the image. Uh, it's a relatively rocky uh, bottom that has both food resources and uh, the possibility for uh, sort of protection from young larval stages, as well as, as far as we understand, a good location for squid eggs. So I'm going to talk about these three different studies. The first one is uh, sort of an innovative approach to uh, both siting and decision making about uh, wind farms. Uh, the second one is a little more straightforward. Uh, eelgrass and shallow hazards as you look at cable landings. Uh, this is uh, the, near the landing site at Block Island. Uh, we did a, a side scan sonar and video uh, to look for eelgrass and also uh, rock, and that helped uh, relocate the cable landing to a, a little better spot. And then a little bit later, I'm going to talk about post-construction uh, potential impacts to hard bottom habitats such as the one you saw before. Oh, let me back up. I, in order to talk about this, I need to draw your attention to this image down here, and we'd have to go back a little bit in time. When the SAMP was still progressing, uh, a lot of attention was being paid to the sighting of the turbines, the scale and the sighting of the turbines off of Block Island. The data that you see here, the map, is uh, uh, multi-beam data collected by John King's lab as part of the SAMP process. The little stars that you see are potential turbine locations, and at this stage in the SAMP, uh, there was an energy area being considered along the south. Uh, it was eventually expanded to include a, an area a little bit larger than this image. But at the time, there were thoughts about what was the optimal place to put the turbines. But as we looked at this data and thought about it, uh, there was a concern about, well, you still need to get a cable from the turbine to a landing spot. So knowing uh, that this feature you see right in the middle here is a, a glacial moraine off of Southeast Ledge, uh, suspecting that it probably had quite a lot of this high value hard bottom habitat. So in advance of doing geophysical surveys beyond this, we went out and did a very rapid reconnaissance survey. We took 200 samples in two days, and we just tried like crazy to find a safe route across this moraine where you could effectively get a cable through there without completely disturbing the hard bottom. And you can see there's loads and loads of images there. Anything that's red was cobble, anything with a black circle around it, we saw squid eggs. And our conclusion was that it really wasn't a viable cable route, and that allowed uh, consideration to begin looking at cable routes on the eastern side of this moraine. So rapid assessment, before spending tons of money on major geophysical surveys, in this particular case, you know, had quite a lot of value. So how were we able to take 200 stations in two days? Uh, this is a sy system that's been widely used for over 40 years. It's called a sediment profile imaging camera. Um, when this system is lowered to the seafloor, the first thing is a trigger uh, takes a photograph looking down. We get a nice high-resolution image of the seafloor looking down. 
The, the frame lands, a large prism is pushed into the seafloor, in this case in hard bottom. We don't get a lot of penetration, but in softer sediments, we get what I consider to be the worm's eye view of the sediment. We get a tremendous amount of information from this. We get high resolution imagery, and we can characterize the ecological conditions of, and, and map seafloor habitats very, very rapidly. So the second, uh, the third survey, actually, is this bottom habitat survey. As Julia mentioned yesterday, there was a requirement to try to actually avoid the same hard bottom habitat we just talked about. So we did multi-beam, we did toad video, and we took away the spy part of the camera and just took plan view images because we knew the bottom was hard. We managed to squeeze in a survey before construction, uh, right after construction, and then a year later as part of this requirement. So what we found was the anchoring activity didn't actually affect the hard bottom. We, we videoed and, and dropped cameras all over it. We couldn't find any evidence of that habitat being altered. But we were able to find these anchor scars. You can see when the initial barges were out there. So the anchors were essentially dragged through the sandy bottom. And what they did was they rolled boulders up out of the bottom and actually created new habitat. By the boulders coming up, we sort of created a, like a train track of, of uh, habitat. Went through a process here. Uh, both the federal and state agencies agreed that uh, we had enough evidence, we didn't need to keep doing this monitoring. But it did show that this construction could be done very carefully adjacent uh, to a hard bottom habitat. So I wanna spend a little time on what I think we've learned from this. Uh, first of all, the reconnaissance of these habitats can be done before and during geophysical surveys. So we've talked a little bit about siting, we've talked a little bit about the engineering requirements, but we also have ecological and benthic habitat requirements to understand as you begin to narrow down where's the cable going to be, where's the a turbine's going to be sited, and then as you move into sort of micro siting within an area. So being able to improve the flow of data is in everyone's interest. So we talked a little bit about, I think Lanny said yesterday, go slow, go slow. Decision making is already relatively slow. There's many, many meetings, many, many steps. But if we aren't informed with data, then we're basically just talking about what might happen. So I'm a big uh, proponent of getting data early and fast and get it out to people as soon as we can. So one of the things we've learned on a number of studies that I'm not talking about here is that we can both ground truth the geophysical data and conduct benthic assessments at the same time. Utilizing that system, uh, supplementing it with grabs, we can actually get a tremendous amount of information uh, very quickly, very early in the process. That allows us to develop very high resolution maps, habitat maps of the seafloor, and that allows that siting process to go on uh, relatively early in the process. I think we've also demonstrated that these high value hard bottom habitats can be avoided during construction, and these were very, very close to Turbine 5. So that's a very important thing because there's going to be areas and sites where that kind of micro siting is going to be very important. So what do we do in the future? Um, I think there's this a sort of assumption that there's a process, you know, a sort of specific process defined by Bohm that we have to follow. And I think Bohm is pretty open to some flexibility in that. So there are some circumstances where we might uh, go out and, and do these kinds of reconnaissance survey before the very, very expensive, what we call G and G surveys, geophysical and geotechnical surveys. If we then also integrate data collection with those geophysical surveys, the geophysical surveys are really for the engineering side of the house, the benthic assessments for, for the permitting side of the house, we integrate them, we're gathering data at the same time and we can use each of those to inform the other. That being said, in order to interpret this data, we need more regional data. This is where I think the next few speakers will, will fill us in a little bit. For instance, how much hard bottom habitat is there in Rhode Island Sound? Is it a limiting resource or do we have quite a lot of it? That's a very important thing for us to understand. 
So again, uh, sorry, Brian, I keep pounding on this, but regional funding and cooperation across all these different projects would really help. Thanks. Thanks, Drew. Uh, and are the posters still up next door? Yes. And there's some more information about that work yes, next door. Yes. Great, yeah. thank you. Uh, Monique? Something good happened. There we go. All right. Good work. All right. All right. Thank you. Today I'm going to talk to you about a benthic habitat mapping study that we did off of the Block Island wind farm. Um, we conducted this study as part of the rodeo project that was funded by BOEM. I want to acknowledge my colleagues, which are Dr. John King, uh, Paul English from Frugro, and also Anwar Khan from HDR. I should also mention that this is an ongoing study, so today I'll talk about samples that we collected in 2016, and we have just finished collecting the samples for 2017. Um, before I talk about our findings, though, I just want to quickly give everyone an overview of what benthic habitat mapping is. So the term benthic means associated with the seafloor. So a benthic habitat is a spatially defined area where the physical, chemical, and biological environment is distinctly different from the surrounding environment. And therefore, benthic habitat mapping involves illustrating the biological and physical characteristics, distribution, and extent of seafloor environments in a geospatial context. So a few examples of benthic habitats are shown in this figure, and you can see there's an oyster reef, a seagrass meadow, an amphipod 2 mat, and a sand flat. So benthic studies are valuable for numerous ecological and management purposes. Um, such studies can improve our understanding of benthic habitats, including their distribution, their patterns, and their processes. We can also establish meaningful relationships between biological communities and their associated environments. These studies also allow us to establish environmental baselines or assess change over time. And they can be important in identifying habitats and species that are important food sources, economically valuable, and are sensitive and or in need of protection. So the goal of this particular study was to assess potential changes in benthic habitats due to the construction and initial operation of the Block Island wind farm. We had several, several hypotheses that we wanted to evaluate during this study. The first one was that there would be no difference in benthic communities among the turbine sites. The second was that there would be no difference in benthic communities between the control sites and the turbine sites. And the third was that there would be no impact on distance from the wind farm foundation regarding benthic communities and organic enrichment. This study also provided us with the opportunity to compare our ocean stamp data set to this new data set and uh, further evaluate change over time in the area. So the sampling location, our sampling strategy was a bit complicated, but we had we took samples at three turbines, turbines one, three, and five, as well as in, within three control sites. At each turbine, we took nine sample stations and three sample stations within each of three distance bands. And those distance bands were 30 to 50 meters, 50 to 70 meters, and then 70 to 90 meters. And those distance bands were in place so we can try to assess any changes with distance from the turbine foundation. And then at each 
sample site, we took three samples. So in total, there were 27 samples taken at each of the turbines. And then for the control sites, we had four sample locations, each with three samples taken. So there are a total of 12 samples at each of the control sites for a total of 117 samples overall. <laughs> At each of the stations, we took a grab, the grab samples and they were analyzed for grain size distribution and also for, um, to identify the biological community composition. So we identified over 18,000 individuals throughout all of the samples and they comprise 139 species. We also affixed a GoPro camera to the grab sampler to get some underwater video to provide a broader context of the habitat type. Most of the species that we recovered belong to three groups. Those were amphipods, polychaete worms, and bivalves. We also deployed a float camera. So this system is programmed to complete a mission of a certain time frame that the user defines. In our case, that was typically 20 minutes. The camera is also equipped with an altimeter, so it's able to maintain a steady, constant distance off of the bottom and it collects images every few seconds, which can then be mosaic together to provide, provide a really high resolution data set and imagery of the seafloor, as you can see here. And then this is a close up um, of the mosaic around the concrete mats that were placed over some of the cable for protection. And again, you can just see the high resolution imagery that we have been able to obtain and the information that it can provide is pretty, pretty uh, useful. Uh, moving on to some of the analyses, I don't have time to go through all of the analyses that we conducted to answer our hypotheses, but I wanted to take a moment to show you this MDS plot because it's a really interesting way to visualize the data. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, each of the symbols represents one of the sample stations, and it's the entire community composition that was recovered at each station is presented here. And then the stations that are closer together are more similar than stations that are further apart. And the main take home message from this plot is there's no clear distinction in the biological communities that are present within the different turbine areas and the control areas. You can see that by all these being relatively clustered together. We can see though that the biological communities at turbine three in the red triangles here and at turbine five in the green triangles are more similar to one another than the community found at turbine one, which are in these blue triangles. There's a little bit more variability here, but again, overall, broadly comparable. And I just want to mention that these orange stars that break out at the bottom, those are taken in one of the control areas, which was found to have a really bouldery environment, which is quite different than the rest of our environments. So that it makes sense that these break out differently, but they are not associated with the turbines. To answer our second hypothesis, um, similar again, the NDS plot shows there is no distinct clusters of the data. So the blue triangles represent the turbine samples and the purple represent the control site samples and there's no clear distinction between those two groups. For our third hypothesis, again, I'll show you the MDS plot um, for a couple of the turbine sites. There's no clear distinction in the benthic community composition with distance from the turbine, as you can see here. And then looking at the organic enrichment, there is very little um, organic content in all of the samples throughout all of the um, study areas. And there is clearly no effect with distance from the turbine. So now taking a step back and looking at this data set and comparing it to the ocean SAMP data set, we found that the communities were broadly comparable. Um, again, the ocean SAMP data set was taken in 2008, so it's nearly 10 years and we can see that there's minimal change over that time frame. Taking a closer look, the, I want to point out though that there are some changes, but as Drew has mentioned and John King mentioned yesterday and today, that when we see change, it doesn't necessarily mean something bad's happening. So not all change is ecologically meaningful, and the changes that we do see here, we consider minor and not ecologically meaningful. Um, for example, the species that have changed here, this is a polychaete worm that's a tube builder that is now defining this portion of the turbine study area, whereas before it was a tube building amphipod. So even though one's an amphipod and one's a polychaete worm, they both serve the same ecological function as tube builders. Um, one more, another instance is this, the turbine one and three are no longer defined by this Lumbernaries uh, polychaete worm, but this species does play 
a key role in this data set and is very much present. So overall, just the conclusions, again, show there's no clear changes in benthic habitats or associated biological communities. None of, has been detected due to the presence of the wind farm at this point in time. Um, comparison of the wind farm and ocean SAMP data further confirm minimal changes have occurred over time. And this study has allowed us to establish a detailed baseline data set of the turbine sites. And again, this next itera iteration of this study is ongoing. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Monique. And uh, next up, we have um, Kevin Stokesbury again, uh, panning the lens out a little bit further to look at a, a larger area. Well, good morning. Thank you uh, very much for uh, uh, having me uh, talk again a little bit about my work. And uh, so, I um, yeah, I'm going to. Uh, Expand out a little bit, and I'd like to, uh, you know, recognize my uh, my colleague David uh, Bethany, who I uh, works with me on all this stuff. So um, I mentioned briefly yesterday uh, the drop camera survey that we do. I'll just, uh, give you a little more description here. Uh, it's a cooperative survey that we uh, develop with the scallop um, fishing industry of the East Coast, and it's designed to be portable to go on any of the different scallop vessels. Uh, it's a uh, it's a drop camera system, and in its present iteration, we've, uh, we, we're getting these high resolution images. So we have uh, three camera views. We have two videos running, and then we get a high resolution digital still, and this digital still now has a uh, resolution of uh, 0.29 millimeters per pixel. So it's a, it's a very high, uh, uh, high uh, um, it's a good picture. <laughs> So, so this is the, the, the we, I started this in 1999 when it was uh, not nearly as fancy where I had to pull it up by hand with a fisherman and, and it's kind of evolved um, over, over the years. Uh, it, in 2003, we expanded it to the entire footprint of the scallop resource, which goes from Virginia up to the uh, Canadian Hague line. And so this is a, a, a compilation of all our stations. Now at each station, at each dot, the pyramid is dropped down and set on the sea floor four times, and so you have the three cameras running at uh, four drops at each station. The largest uh, scale we do is a 5.56-kilometer uh, uh, grid, and then we do much higher resolution scales in areas that are either uh, important for, for habitat or, or mostly it's, it's primarily used to assess the scallop resource, and so that's why you see a lot of those high uh, dense areas in the, uh, in the closed areas, but then up on in the Gulf of Maine. Um, our, our, our grid is about um, uh, one kilometer. And we've actually extended it. We've worked with the Canadians. We've done the Canadian side of George's Bank now, and we're all the way up to uh, Bank Row Bank and um, uh, Brown's Bank on the Canadian side. So we're, we're kind of slowly, slowly creeping out. Um, what it does is a it's all a visual survey. We don't actually collect samples, which is uh, helpful for uh, collect physical samples because it's helpful for um, getting around permits and such. Uh, but, and it does very good at, at recording the, the, the larger um, sediments like rock, cobble, and, and granule pebble. Uh, but for the fine s sediments, other than just saying it's sand or, or sand ripple, it's not so great. But you can combine it in this uh, example. We combine it with the USGS uh, grab sample. And so you start to put these databases together uh, you start to get some really valuable uh, images and descriptions of the of the sea floor. It also we set it up um, on a on this grid pattern with the idea of being able to to change the the the, the sizes of the different you know in, in when we set it up for closed areas, but to different uh, examples and to look at it and to be able to, without paying post stratification uh, penalties to look at um, different areas. So in this example. We did survey, we were funded by the, the um, Massachusetts to survey the wind farm area in 2012 and 2013. So on this table, WF stands for wind farm, uh, CS is the continental shelf, GB is Georgia's bank, and the mid-Atlantic. And so you can look at, just as a simple example of the percentages of the, um, the uh, uh, substrate that we saw in each of the, um, the quadrats. So it allows you to start doing some uh, comparisons in that way. Uh, here's a couple of uh, high-resolution digital stills. One is the, the far one is of um, Cox's Ledge, 
And so uh, in that, you do see the similar to the other um, presenters that were talking about the hard uh, substrat. We saw that as well. You can see the uh, squid eggs up in the top corner. But most of the area is a fine sand uh, sediment covered uh, sand dollars are, are very prominent. And uh, my, my daughter was uh, unable to get a job for a couple of years, so I made her count sand dollars. And there's nothing more inspiring for a teenager than to get out and get a job and count 70,000 sand dollars or so. Uh, but it's also important for um, um, uh, uh, the, the flatfish. So when we, uh, we our, our work's also been used with uh, uh, the Habitat Omnibus developed by the New England Fisheries Management Council. This is the, the grid that they um, used and uh, a while ago the Nature Conservancy uh, came to us and said, well, could we put our, our work together with uh, Dr. Chen's work, who has the FECOM model, and because all that work was uh, used in the, in the habitat management plan, and so we wanted to make it publicly available. So we, we combined these onto uh, the grid that was used in the habitat omnibus, and in the data set you can go and you can put your, your cursor on any grid, and this is the kind of uh, information that comes up, how many stations were in the area and what kind of compilation you have. And uh, then that uh, is all put on the data, uh, the data portal. And so this is uh, the, the FV, so it's important to link the physical with the uh, biological. So this is the FVCOM generation uh, for bottom temperature. It does bottom temperature, current, uh, surface temperature. And from that, you can also calculate bottom stress. And this is uh, the example over here is the extremely warm temperature we saw in 2012 for the entire continental shelf. Then I, I've just presented two examples of the different, this is, uh, we have two types of data in the data set. We have present absent, which is uh, what we use for bryozoa, hydrozoa, sponge, that, the, mostly the colonial uh, organisms. But it does give you, so, so what this is, is uh, whether it's present or absent in each quadrat and four quadrants at each station, and then the stations combined into the, uh, into the grid. Uh, but you can also do uh, averages on it. So you could get that, or for um, the more scallop-centric kind of uh, uh, animals, such as uh, scallops, or in this case, sand dollars, which prey on scallops, we count the individuals, and you can get the numbers per meter squared um, right through from the images. So, so all that information from 2003 into 2012 is on the portal. We now have the data set up to 2017. Uh, looking a little closer at the, uh, the Massachusetts wind farm area, as I said, we sampled it in 2012 and 2013. Uh, this is just the most simplest of, of indices, the percent similarity index, where you, you calculate the percentages and you can compare. So if it's 100% similar, they're exactly the same. And, and so these are the most dominant um, features that we saw. We saw whole sand dollars, sea stars skates and and so I, what i'm trying to get at with this table is that even without any kind of interference you only had about 65 percent similarity just between one year and the next so that kind of annual variation is is very important had you had you not had a bit of a time series like that you could put the wind farm in and say oh well it caused a 35 percent uh, variation and that's that wouldn't be true at all it's just a natural variation uh, the other point is that um, this was a very cursed survey. It was, you know, really more of a preliminary. Uh, we did see some hard substrat in one sample. I thought it was maybe a coral. I sent the image to Peter Oster down in Yukon, and he thought it was the tubularia worm. So there is an advantage to taking the physical, or, um, you know, collecting the samples that you can hold in your hand and actually examine as well. So that's a little bit of a limitation, but. Uh, at least it, it, it gives you an idea, and I do want to point out that anything we see is, is relatively common because we're taking so few samples compared to the area. Thank you. And that, um, I was going to show you a little, little bit of a video just of the, the, you know, some GoPro images, but I got the one minute wave and, and, and uh, with the computer pushing it, I, I, I won't, but I, what, I will, <laughs> what I will say is that the, uh, you know, the, the real advantage for someone who's worked with the, the, the absolute ob obnoxiousness of trawl surveys, uh, to have digital still images so that, you know, our work can be linked up with Drew's and with money, you know, it, it's so much easier to compile and use these different kind of data sets uh, together because of the techniques. It's a really, you know, it's a great time to be working on this stuff. And so it's not, 
you know, there's, you know, all, all everything that you've seen so far can be put together and just move forward. So, with that, uh, I'll, I'll, that's my lesson learned, I guess. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. We're doing well on time, uh, and I think Sue's our last speaker. Start thinking about your questions. Hello, Sue Tuxbury with NOAA Fisheries Service. I'm with the Habitat Conservation Division. And um, yesterday I talked a bit about our work with fisheries, and today I'm going to focus on habitat and essential fish habitat and some of our work with Block Island, but largely um, what we're looking at for the larger um, offshore wind areas. And let me, okay. So, um, but I'm going to keep it broad and, and not bore you with the regulatory details. <laughs> so um, largely our role, um, we sit on the BOEM task force forces from Maine to Virginia, that's our region. Um, we coordinate regularly with BOEM, um, with the state agencies. Um, I regularly talk to Julia Livermore and Catherine Ford um, regularly on these projects. And I think, you know, Grover touched on it a little bit yesterday, the states, you know, because they're on the ground, certainly have a greater capacity to get more involvement from the community and, and feedback from the community and, and set up those, you know, working groups, um, which has been a tremendous help for us and for, for me and what I do. We also coordinate internally between our protected resources with our sustainable fisheries service, with our port agents as well, who are out in the field, um, and our science center. And I probably should have touched on a little more yesterday, but we also do coordinate with Fisheries Management Council staff. And um, as these projects are, are moving forward, we're, that, we're ramping up on that coordination, I should say. Um, and we also meet with the developers on the project and as, as the projects progress. Um, we regularly advocate for, um, for coordination and communication with the fishing industry and um, with the councils. Um, we advocate to BOEM and, and to the uh, developers. Um, we're a stakeholder in planning for monitoring and science needs. Um, you know, each year I try and work with our science center to when BOEM puts out proposals for ideas on, on potential things to study. Um, I usually am, get with our science center and try and at least put some ideas out there. Um, and we, we provide feedback throughout the process. And then we also do the EFH consultation, which is, um, we work under, under Magnuson for that. Um, so I'm gonna focus on that, but, but you know, a lot of people wonder, well, what is EFH? Um, I should say that you know, the entire offshore area has EFH, has mapped um, designated EFH for federal species. The definition is um, waters and substrate necessary for fish for, for spawning, breeding, feeding, or growth to maturity. So yesterday, you know, it was brought up, um, questions about forage species. Well, that's part of EFH because, um, you know, food for a federally managed species with designated EFH fits under the EFH umbrella. Um, so, and it's also, it's not just benthic habitat that we heard about in the bottom, but it's also pelagic habitat. And that includes, you know, physical, chemical, and biological properties. Um, so, so we're looking at the bottom, we're looking at the water column. Um, it's really, you know, it's a large umbrella. It's kind of looking at the, the ecosystem. Um, also areas that are historically used by fish. So, you know, you'll see with some fisheries, there's areas where there'll be years up and down as far as catches and, and the individual species use of a certain area. So we still consider that to be EFH, even if it's an off year and, and they're not in the area, that, that part. Potential utilization areas are also included under EFH. Um, so our job is to, we actually will use all the data that was just presented today um, and put together conservation recommendations. And these are meant to first avoid, minimize, or mitigate potential adverse impacts. And adverse impacts can be um, any impact that reduces the quality or quantity of EFH. So direct, indirect, cumulative impacts. 
So, and we provide these conservations over the larger project, we'll provide these conservation recommendations to BOEM. Um, for, the, for the Block Island project, it was the Corps of Engineers because it was in state waters. Um, so I'm not gonna go into details on our recommendations. Julia Livermore's talk yesterday was a, did a good overview um, of Rhode Island's um, conditions and their water quality cert, and, and our recommendations were largely consistent with that. Um, we focused on benthic habitat, noise, community structure, and monitoring. Um, Drew just gave a talk on, on some of the benthic habitat work that they did, um, which was a, a vital part of, of you know, what we were asking for. They did a great job of really mapping, mapping out the area and incorporating that into their planning so they were able to avoid. Um, we also recommended on the fisheries surveys, and, and there was a, you know, the industry was involved in that, we were involved in that, the state was involved in that. Um, you know, our, I gave it to our science center, got feedback from our science center on it. Um, and also we looked at noise and cable installation. So looking at the larger scale, um, you know, and even if you were to wind it down just to the southern New England area, um, so when we're looking at these projects, I can see all of our questions that we had with the Block Island project fitting in, but then also a whole lot more because of the scale. Um, I, I envision, you know, we have questions about impacts on pelagic habitat, um, hot spot spawning areas, you know, any um, potential, you know, localized current changes that might affect larval settlement. Those are all things that I think will play a larger role in these, you know, looking at these large scale projects. Um, so, and, you know, to, to Drew's point, you know, this kind of begs for some regional studies given the close proximity. <laughs> um, so, lessons learned. Um, I would say coordinate early and often in the process. I was trying to think about it last night. I think 2009 was our first meeting with Deepwater Wind, and we met with them probably more times than I can count uh, um, before this project actually went up. Um, and I was glad to see, actually, Drew and I have some similar lessons learned. Because <laughs> um, avoidance, the, the Block Island, I think the Block Island project did demonstrate that avoidance of sensitive habitat is possible. Um, you know, and you know, they, they mapped it out, they put together an anchoring plan, and they were able to avoid these areas for the large part. We, you know, the, the habitat, the, the monitoring of impacts of hard bottom habitat was cut short because they avoided the area. Um, so I, you know, will always continue to push avoid first, um, and that should be looked at. And, you know, though it may be a challenge, it's certainly, I think, an important step. Um, Identify information needs for planning and siting and, um, and share data early in the process. So, you know, the, the Rhode Island Ocean Samp was certainly critical with the Block Island helping with siting. Um, you have the, the regional portals that, will, that are being used for the larger areas. Um, but there's also, when characterizing the site, more site-specific data that does need to be collected and incorporated. Um, and I would say with the Block Island project, um, I'm, we met regularly. As, as Drew was collecting this data, he was meeting, you know, he was showing me the data. We were talking about ways to, okay, okay how can we, you know, route the cable so we can avoid this? And, and, and that was, so most of the work was done up front. Um, and as was mentioned on the fisheries panel yesterday, the, um, Deepwater Wind had met with the industry and were able to microsite and move some of the turbines based on their request. So I think that sharing the information and sharing some of the data, even if it's preliminary up front with the regulatory agencies, can certainly help, cer absolutely help keep surprises out of the process and, and make it run more smoothly. Um, these are some thoughts also for going forward. Establishing a monitoring program which incorporates more than just um, regulatory stakeholders and looks regionally. So, um, again, the Block Island project, their, their fisheries and lobster study was done, you know, they incorporated industry and um, the scientific community in that, and I think that's going to be really important as well. And I, and I think BOEM is starting to look at that with their, um, they put together the National Academy of Sciences steering committee. Kevin sits on that committee and, and, um, I think we're starting to, to move in that direction, hopefully, and I think that's 
that's going to be important because I don't think the regulatory sh community should be working in a bubble on this one. Uh, so, and also regional studies. So it, it's clear that there's still questions on how we're going to define region, um, but I think the regional studies are important. The regulatory process goes, you know, is done project by project um, because that's how the, they get their permits. But given the fact that these are large scale projects immediately adjacent to each other, I think um, there needs to be some regional studies. And we need to, um, you know, it's clear a lot of data has been collected on Block Island, and, and we will certainly use that data, and BOEM will use that data, and, and between some of the studies we heard this morning and the rodeo work that BOEM's been doing, um, that's certainly important and should be used, but we also have to consider the scale. And, and when we look at some of these offshore projects that are coming up, it's cumulative impacts, which, you know, was said a number of times and probably can't be said enough, needs to be you know, considered here and, and the scale of these projects. So we have to think about what other information needs um, we need to look at given the, the large scale of these projects. So that's all I have. That's my contact information if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, those are great talks from the uh, up close to the broader, um, the broader view. I'm going to ask one question of the panel and then uh, open it up for uh, all your questions. We have about 22 minutes uh, based on our schedule. Um, so I guess my question is, following up on some of the talks yesterday where we, it was discussed that it's really hard to know which habitats are really important. Uh, and I think that my understanding of the process is that um, for basically regulatory reasons, there's been a focus on hard bottom habitats. All of you presented information about many other habitats. Are we overly focused on hard bottom? And if so, which other habitats should we be really uh, focusing on as we go forward into the next project? I would just say, yeah, the, the hard bottom habitat was certainly a focus for Block Island because of the proximity of one of the turbines to that habitat. Um, but eelgrass was also included, um, and a lot of a lot of because a lot of you know that was sort of taken off the table for monitoring because they were able to avoid it and, and early in the process. So, but there's certainly when we start looking at offshore, I would say other habitats that need to be considered, such as such as um, first, I know that's a persistent hydrographic front. Well, I, I mean, edge edge habitats are often focused on whether they're hard or not, just just breaks and slope. Um, but I th I think the in order to fully put that into context, it also is important to determine what is the potential impact on a habitat. So, for example, a relatively soft bottom habitat that has a cable placement. So you use a jet plow or a, a plow of some kind. If it's done properly and done well, you know, our studies show that that uh, habitat is going to recover very, very quickly. So there is a short-term impact, um, but, you know, arguably not that different from, a, say, a trawl impact or, or something of that nature. So some habitats are able to cope very well with disturbance and others are not. So for instance, you know, very well sorted sand moves around all the time and so moving it around is not a big issue. If the impact is to alter that habitat, cover it, you know, change it dramatically, then you have a different equation and you have to look at is it an important foraging resource? Is it, is it going to be replaced by a habitat that is either better or worse than that? Um, so it's not easy to give a straightforward answer. I think the reason hard bottom has been focused is that it's, uh, it takes longer to recover, it's more easily, you know, damaged, um, at least that would be my perspective. Others? Yeah, I mean, my, uh, my thinking uh, on it, or my bet anyway, is that you're actually going to increase the hard bottom habitat. I mean, certainly you're increasing it by putting putting the, 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 the structures for the turbines themselves in it, and the work in Europe shown that the, you know, those create a, a, a substantial amount of uh, habitat. And then you know, if you have those uh, 
concrete um, covers over the the um, uh, cables, as Monique showed, you're, you're going to have that's going to be more habitat as well. I think that um, you know how how the currents are affected with scouring, how the uh, you know there you know what is the advantage of having large open areas of of uh, sand um, for some of the flatfish species and and that type of thing is something that we don't really have a have a very good handle on, and so I. I, I I think that the the classic measures of ecology, as far as biodiversity or increased uh, biomass, it, you, you know, if you measure it just as a success that way, my prediction is you'll probably increase those. But um, you know, you are changing them. I would also say that as we've continued to conduct these studies and understand how species utilize their habitat and the food resources that are there, we'll be able to better identify areas that are more valuable. For example, the areas with dense amphipod 2 mats that we have found off Block Island. Yesterday, Jeremy Colley showed that that was an important fish food resource for uh, flounder, so that could be something to consider in the future. Yeah, I think that those kind of triage questions are going to be, you know, top of mind for a lot of developers and regulators. Okay, um, questions. I see uh, John Williamson in the front row. So just for those of you playing at home, uh, the question is about sort of sequencing of research methods in order to do microsighting. And I think also the scale of Block Island compared to uh, the projects that are on the table. Uh, so John, there's a, uh, maybe a couple of different ways I'd answer that. Um, first of all, just the scale. Um, if uh, the guidelines uh, that BOEM has promulgated are followed, uh, which they undoubtedly are, um, then the, uh, the mapping detail that's obtained within uh, wind project areas is equivalent to what you were seeing at Block Island. So with modern high resolution methods of mapping, uh, we get submeter scale detail. Uh, tremendous detail in those micro uh, distribution of habitats. Interpreting them, of course, is a, another matter. Um, the density of sampling, uh, either that, that Kevin's able to do or that, that we have done, like on the NYSERDA project, a very, very large area reconnaissance, necessarily is a little less intense than what you see at Block Island. So in that respect, the uh, the process does need to be iterative. Big, large-scale map, focus, focus, get your resources of sampling as close to where you expect to do things as possible. The reason why I think there's some value in whether it's you know tapping into Kevin's data or uh, the uh, TNC broad data and then doing some reconnaissance is that um, you're able to uh, basically avoid areas Part of it is, throughout much of this area, we have very, very little existing data. Okay, it's very, I mean, there's 1919 lead, you know, soundings that are still being used. So, it, you know, we, we have to improve that data quality. But uh, the effort of doing the geophysical survey is extremely expensive. 
So if you can narrow that down and avoid areas that you know are not feasible with a more uh, effect or simpler method, um, then that, that helps use those resources well. So that, that's kind of what I was trying to get at there. Uh, but um, I think um, the tools we have and the approaches that we're using are actually quite effective even at a larger scale. You spend a lot more money. I mean, that's, that's the end of it. Yeah. It's unavoidable. Thanks, Drew. Anybody else want to weigh in? Um, Anna. So again, just to repeat the question is about transient habitats, physical properties like fronts and that kind of thing. Do we have what we need or do we need new tools and techniques? I, well, I'll, I'll take a crack at, at starting that. I, I think that we're actually, you know, you always you always want to continue the development, but we're actually at a really good phase. We have some, some very good high resolution oceanographic models that are good at, at defining um, uh, things like turbulence uh, upwelling, you know, they're being used for icing with the Coast Guard. They're being used for, for flood examination. Uh, so, so it's it's really kind of linking the, that information. We also with the uh, with the drop camera systems and the uh, the 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 type of uh, um, gliders and that type of information. I mean, there's a there's a lot of potential to collect it. It's, it's coordinating it uh, and it's making sure that you have the commitment to get out there and, and do it and to keep these, these series going. But uh, you know, I think we're at a pretty good spot for, for measuring that kind of thing. Drew? I guess the one thing I would say that is a little difficult is that uh, the collection of the high resolution bottom imagery is so expensive that uh, if there are ephemeral features of sand waves, of migration, uh, changes in, in density of, of organisms, it's hard to spend the money year after year to collect that unless you're able to narrow down on one specific area. And this is where I think the monitoring programs that, that follow can potentially give us some clue. So if you're, if you're uh, collecting data on one specific type of habitat, you know, over a period of time, uh, that can serve as a proxy for other habitats that you expect are behaving similarly, same water depth, same exposure, that sort of thing. I, I, I'm going to jump in there one more second on that because I, I think that we, in, in a way, as, as scientists, we're, we're also kind of limited in, in our thinking of of scale and about you know finances with this. I mean, our our survey, that broad scale survey, the industry donates about uh, a quarter of a million a year, and we you know run our run that project on about half a million, half a million. So less than a million dollars. You're surveying from Florida all the way to uh, to uh, um, the Hague line. So it's you know that that's not a huge amount of money compared to the. Uh, the, well, the scallop fishery, for example, is a, is a half a billion dollar a year industry. Um, these wind farms are going to be, I mean, it's huge money. And I think that, you know, we don't, we shouldn't be constrained in how we're thinking about what we need to do this to do it right. Thanks. I've got uh, Grover. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess as a regulatory agency, I would ask this question. Obviously, there's potentially a period of rapid development that's going to occur here, and that's where most of the money gets fronted for these studies. Um, then we move into two years or maybe even three years post-construction monitoring. But there's very little that then is provided for, say, a five or ten year look at that, that system. Is that something that as regulators we should be thinking about in terms of conditions being placing? we're 
so condensed on this very short window of six to eight years. So again, the question is about long-term monitoring, right? Yeah. I would argue yes, I think we should. And I, I think that's why, you know, setting up a, a monitoring program that incorporates, you know, industry and science. And so we can do a longer-term monitoring so we can follow up on some other questions that may arise while, while we're out or while the folks are out collecting the information. Um, I think that would be important in a, in a model we should strive for. I agree with that also, and also having pre-construction data is really valuable too, as Kevin talked about, and I talked about a bit too. There's some of those environments change quite a bit over time, and not having pre-construction data, you're not sure if the changes that you're seeing is a result of the construction, or if it was already a very variable environment to begin with. Can I ask a follow-up question about data availability? So uh, there's lots of work going on. Kevin mentioned that some of his work has been shared through up to the data portal. You know, is there stuff that's like in Drew's basement right now? Uh, I mean, how much, you know, I know that there's some uh, information that's collected on the developer's dimes, which is proprietary, but when we're talking about uh, system level monitoring, you know, how is that data being shared and should we be doing something else? And then I've got Dave with a question right after that. All right, since you're gonna poke around in my basement, uh, yeah, there's a lot of data there, but um, I think I'd kind of combine this with Grover's question, which is that I guess in my mind, once projects have been approved and are built, uh, particularly this band of projects going from the Rhode Island mass wind energy area right through the, you know, they're continuous, literally, that that kind of larger scale, longer term monitoring, you know, I think would be more valuable if it was coordinated, if it was one big piece, um, and that there's some cost sharing between uh, the developers, the uh, agencies, uh, you know, that, that it's, a, it's a comprehensive thing as opposed to a patchwork of different efforts. And then the data is no longer really proprietary, it's just kind of looking at the big picture. Um, that would be my take. I see a lot of head nodding in the crowd. Anybody else want to pile on that one? Um, let me go to Dave Monty. Uh, very quickly, uh, this is from Anik and Drew primarily, but the other panel. I know that there were, uh, the study that you did on the bottom were sort of unremarkable and didn't really show anything with great changes. Was there anything that you saw that would, um, that merits uh, further study with the cumulative impact? In other words, the study was I think that for our study, we were expecting, if any, effects would be pretty close to the turbine within 100 meters or so. So if you space the turbines out, you know, a half mile apart or a mile apart, then the cumulative impacts probably wouldn't be great. But it's a good point. Uh, certainly based on the work that we've done there, and I, I guess I'd be combining both the fishery and the, and the habitat data, um, I would agree with Monique that I don't see anything in there. And I think it's important, Kevin pointed this out, and I could have reinforced it better yesterday, that most of our studies are designed really to detect pretty dramatic changes. In other words, if there's, we know there's variability inherent, and the, just the nature of the kind of data, the complexity of it, um, Unless there's a pretty dramatic change, we're not necessarily going to see small, subtle shifts. They happen anyway, as you know, from year to year. The catch is different. The, the big concentrations of amphipods come and go, and nobody knows why. Um, so it's a fail-safe. It's, it's really looking for, is there any dramatic change? And if there's not, well, that's the nature of the system. So um, no, I don't see that even though we do have to look at each habitat differently, I don't see the scale as, as really being any different. Um, 
I think that was a big take home for me about yesterday and at the National Academies meeting was really focusing on the difference between effect, which is any detectable change, and impact, which is uh, you know a sort of an important change, whether your definition is alters EFH or alters the delivery of an ecosystem service. So I think those things are, you know, that's something that we always need to um, keep in mind. I want to go to Eileen for one more question, and I think that might be it. I would just add, add, oh, sorry. add one thing on that, but um, even from an EFH standpoint, we expect there to be impacts to EFH. I mean, there will be impacts. I mean, what we also have interest in, an interest in is the significance of that and, and the, you know, the regional implications of that, particularly for sustainable, for fisheries. So and direction, just, for that matter. Yeah. Could be positive or negative. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The impact is either way. So. Go ahead. So a couple of things um, in terms of sharing data. Um, you know, the only data from a deep water wind point of view that we really consider proprietary is wind data. We've publicly committed a number of times to share the rest of our data um, and make it public. And, and how does that happen is we're hopeful that um, we would upload that to the uh, data portals once the studies are completed and um, you know we'll work with Nick on that and, and make sure that it gets uploaded as the studies are completed and the final reports are published like for example now uh, we could likely upload the hard bottom habitat data but we're not quite re yet ready to upload the demersal trawl or lobster survey data since that has one more year but we do share those reports um, the interim reports with agencies and other interested stakeholders you know, throughout the study. But, um, so that's just kind of some clarity on, I think, what, you know, what what we should be doing as an industry is supporting regional science. I mean, we beat that drum all the time and, and we, we should, you know, I think that that's really important. So the other thing was, um, you know, this whole concept of um, having, you know, science be collaborative and having agencies and developers and everybody come together is something that we've talked about a lot, but it's, it's really kind of tricky to wrap your head around it. So we've got phones spending money, we've got DOE spending money, we've got private developers spending money, we've got grants and, and foundation money. And so, um, you know, I am interested from the panel if you have any ideas, I mean, on how that comes, how that goes from concept to reality. With onshore wind energy, they have the BASC and Wind Energy Collaborative, they have the American Wind Wildlife Institute. I, I don't think we want to take something that's been established for onshore wind and, and have them, I mean, I'm sure they'd be happy to jump offshore and help us solve all of our problems, but I don't think that that's the right approach. I think it's a regional issue and it should be kind of dealt with regionally with people who have um, worked with these issues for a number of years. So I am interested to see how you think we go from this concept to this uh, reality of everyone working together thoughtfully executing the science and funds where it gets real tricky is money, right? Like different money coming in and things like that. So just some thoughts I think would be helpful to start that conversation. So again, this question is about uh, collaboration. It's not all that easy. Uh, how do we, you know, how do we do that? This is like a policy question going to a group of scientists. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> and we're and we're running a little, yeah. Everybody brings it up. No, yeah. We all right. Talk about, we've been talking yeah. about this for years. So I know that Sue and Kevin and Drew have put thought into it. Yeah, yeah. So we're running a little short on time. So a quick, uh, quick response um, to uh, to Eileen's question about how we better collaborate. What does it look like? They, I can't say I have the answers, but I think and Boehm is starting to look at this. I mean, you're going to need. You know, especially for a regional study, you're going to need some sort of, you know, I don't know if it's like an in lieu fee type setup, like a bank where people can put, you know, there's got to be some sort of setup, like kind of, like, and I don't want to say pass through, but there's got to be some organization that's responsible for the, for the funds that, and that would all, you know, so, so you could get the regional, you know, the regional studies and it wouldn't just be, and then maybe the developers would pay into that, but I, that's beyond my pay grade or expertise, so. Okay, Drew, your thoughts in less than 30 seconds. It just occurred to me, I don't know if Nick is still here, but that the framework of NROC might be a place, even if it's just trying to figure out how to make this work, because that is very much a policy body. Uh, it engages a lot of different uh, policy levels. 
and it is regional and it's functioning and, and has done a lot of really excellent work. So I'd, I'd sort of kick it upstairs, I guess. <laughs> okay, with that, I think we're out of time. I'd like to thank our panel. Uh, thanks very much. And all of you for your questions. I believe that we're going to a 15-minute break. We'll resume here at 10.15 with the next panel. Thank you. Test, test, NPR, can you hear me? NPR, can you hear me? Test, test, one, two. Test, test, one, two. NPR, can you hear me? Test, test, test. Mic four. Look behind, look behind you, can you see me? Give me a wave. Give me a wave. Give me a wave and you can hear me? Can you hear me? NPR. NPR. Test, 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 test.
Test, test, NPR, test, test. Test, 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 mic one, NPR, NPR. Test, test. Test, test, mic one, test, test. <laughs> test, test, mic one, test, test. <laughs> test, test, mic one. Test, test, mic one, test, test, mic one. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Test, test, Avery, Avery, NPR, test, 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 test. One, two, three, one, two, three. Test, test, Mike. Mike, test for NPR. NPR, Mike, test, out of house. How's it sounding? Is it sounding weird? Still bad. Still bad. Bad. How's it sounding?
Test, test, mic audio. Test, 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 test. Test, test, NPR, testing for science. Test, test, mic one, test.
Good morning. We're ready to start our after break session. All right, so this one is briefly titled Birds and Bats. Um, and uh, I'll be moderating the panel. My name is Jack Clark. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Mass Audubon. And I actually started working on offshore wind farms and proposals and impacts on wildlife in 2001 when the Army Corps of Engineers was the only permitting agency issuing a Section 10 and the Minerals Management Service wasn't really sure what this stuff was all about. Uh, so we went from there to the Energy Policy Act and a variety of other um, things such as the creation of BOEM. Anyway, so there's uh, been a, a few changes on our, on our panel. We're going to start off with uh, Peter Patton, who's professor from URI's College of Environment and Life Sciences. Uh, Dick Veet was unable to attend this morning, so but we will still be covering some of his uh, data. We're also um, going to be hearing from Pam Loring, who's a biologist, along with Scott Jackson, who's the chief of op the op population branch, Division of Migratory Birds, at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And then Joy Prescott will be sitting in for Bob Roy, and she's a senior project manager at Stantec. So we will have our, our first presentation, which will be about seven minutes, but we can continue for another 10 uh, regarding um, some of the work Dick Veet is doing. And then at the very end, we'll take uh, questions. So thank you. Good morning. So uh, I was going to just do a little background about uh, um, what we know about the potential impact of wind turbines on birds and bats. And most of this comes from work in Europe. So there's three factors that ornithologists are really consider, uh, were concerned about. Collision mortality, displacement of the birds from, from foraging habitat and roosting habitat, and the barrier effects that wind turbines um, can cause in terms of local flight patterns um, and regional migratory flights. So when you think about uh, wind turbines, everybody, the general public thinks about collision mortality, and this comes from Altamont, which has about five to 7,000 wind turbines in California. There's a major problem there with collision mortality, particularly with raptors, about 100 eagles are killed per year, lots of red-tailed hawks and burrow owls too. Um, that led to lawsuits by the Golden Gate Audubon Society. Um, there wasn't much planning that went into the placement of this, this wind facility, and there's lots of changes being made to replace a lot of these turbines that cause major mortality events for birds. Um, if you look at the kind of the overall avian mortality estimate, for at least based on wind-based wind turbines, based on a meta-analysis, about five birds per year per turbine is the estimated mortality. Um, some turbines can be much higher than that, but overall annual. But the cumulative impacts, um, given the fact there's about 45,000 wind turbines in North America, that equals about 230,000 avian mortalities per year. So that's the figure that people keep in the back of their mind. Um, what about the offshore environment? It's really impossible to really estimate collision mortality because anytime something collis collides with an offshore wind turbine, it goes in the ocean and never can find it again. So we have to go to other um, facilities, uh, infrastructure, to kind of look at the risks that these uh, facilities might pose. Um, and we know that in certain weather conditions, you get fallouts of birds to, for example, this, um, this lighthouse in Maine, um, and particularly these lighthouses where you have this flashing uh, solid white light, and it tends to attract lots of birds to it. Um, so um, solid white lights aren't good. Flashing red lights um, really reduce the risk to birds, and so that's why in these offshore wind turbines, flashing red lights are the are what's used to minimize attraction of the birds from collision to birds. Um, so what about displacement? So this is uh, data collected in Denmark um, on this one species long-tailed duck, and they did surveys before they put constructed the wind farm, and they did surveys after they constructed the wind farm. And what this represents is those areas, and the wind farm in this case is this, this black 
rectangle is where the wind farm is located, and areas in red are areas where there's a major decline in the species and, and the long-tailed ducks in that area. So you can see where the wind farm um, occurs, there's a, a major reduction in the birds. The blue represents where there's an increase in the number of individuals. So there's a displacement of birds away from the wind farm. Um, barrier effects, wind farms, we know from Europe that barrier, um, wind farms can be major barriers. So in the upper on the left-hand side is uh, radar studies of common eiders. And so each black line represents a track based on radar data of one individual. Um, and you can see the upper panel it shows the flight paths of birds before the wind farm went into place. And then when the lower panel is when the wind farm went into place, you can see the birds are displaced away from the wind farm. Some individuals will fly for the wind farm, but most of them do not. Um, and this panel on the right shows movements of three northern gannets with satellite transmitters on them. They go from the breeding colony where the star is located. And you can the, the blues and the reds represent uh, wind farms. And you can see in particular that there's very little movement of, of northern gannets through this wind, the wind farm. And does this have a pointer? Oh, I've got it, sorry. So this, you can see the birds are moving around. They're not going through the, so this is another species that displaced by the wind farm. So this confuses, so there's a, a recent meta-analysis just looking at do wind farms attract birds or deter birds? And this is a little bit confusing, but in the, so this is based on a meta-analysis of 20 wind facilities. Each column represents a separate wind facility. And then on the left-hand side, each row represents a species. And then the colors, um, if they're in oranges or red, brighter oranges and different, they avoid the wind farm. If they're in the greens, they're attracted to the wind farm. So you can go across a particular row and see that species is, um, avoids the wind farm. And you can go down the columns to see some facilities didn't see much evidence of avoidance or attraction where the other ones did. Um, if you kind of summarize that all together, you can see this is, even though this is Europe, these same species occur in North America. Um, you can see red-throated loons and other gannets that really avoid the wind farms. Other species, long-tailed long ducks, a, a weak avoidance. And then common terns are kind of indifferent. That is, they'll fly, they'll, they don't, aren't attracted, but don't, aren't deterred by the wind farms. And then species like cormorants and gulls tend to be attracted to the wind farms. So given that information, the, the things that we're, we were considered um, when we started the, the bird surveys for the Ocean SAMP, we really wanted to figure out where the key areas where the birds used in the Rhode Island uh, offshore waters. There weren't any, there was no quantitative data on the distribution of birds before we started our surveys. So we first started doing ship-based surveys um, in, throughout 2009 and 2010. Um, in these grids, and then we moved to aerial surveys to get a uh, complete coverage of the um, ocean SAMP study area. So we did 41 flights over a two and a half year period over these, these transects. So it's about 30 miles offshore. So we can got complete coverage of the, of the study area. And then what we did was, so on the, this is the modeling process that we went to to come up with the distribution maps for birds in the study area. So this happens to show the distribution of common loons. So we have the locations where birds were detected. We went through something called the distance framework to figure out the probability of detecting birds. Um, then we estimated the density of birds in those segments. Then we brought in a series of environmental covariates into our models. Then we went through this modeling process to come up with our final model of the distribution of where we thought common loons occurred in our study area. And then there's also uncertainty associated with that too. In the case of common loons, you can see they're really commonly uh, attracted to the coast and then around Block Island. So we have a series of models like this, and I'm not going to bore you with all the different species, but I just want to show the general distribution pattern um, uh, based on these models. Is that This is for black scoter. They tend to be concentrated again along the coast and between Montauk and Block Island. And then Pam Loring for her master's research um, did satellite telemetry and looked at the movements of black scoters, and you can see the distribution based on her data of off of Montauk and off the coast of Rhode Island and off of Martha's Vineyard is very similar to our, based on uh, the same results we got based on aerial surveys. Um, 
so the, the key thing is, is those shallow habitats are where lots of species of birds are concentrated in Rhode Island. And that led to, um, the, with, based on the, the ocean samp, these surveys, there's no turbines in Rhode Island that are allowed in waters less than 20 meters deep. Um, so that's, in key, that's protecting key forage and habitat for sea ducks and loons and other species of marine birds. Um, so based on all that, we have the, um, the wind farm. And so what are some of the important take-home messages from our surveys? First of all, those fine-scale pre-construction surveys are critical to, to find an area that minimize the impacts um, to birds. Um, and you need data collected over multiple years. We, we, in our case, we collected over three years because there's lots of annual variation. Um, so to get a good handle on where the birds are using, you need those multiple years of data. Um, and then the post-construction surveys, which we just talked about, are critical, and that's what the other speakers will be talking about. So, thank you. The question was, the five birds per turbine per year, that's averaged over all turbines. That's, that's an overall turbine. So some of those old school lattice structure, it can be much, it, the rates can be much higher in the order of 50 to 60 birds per turbine per year. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Pam. Oh, you're going to do dick, oh, dick feet you're now. dick feet now, okay. <laughs> dick feet. <laughs> so the next speaker is Dick Veet, um, who's done lots of research off of Massachusetts, and um, unfortunately he couldn't be here today, so I'm standing in for him um, and his colleagues. Um, so he's done a lot of offshore surveys, well, for a long time, but what I'm talking about today is some of the aerial survey work that he's done off of Massachusetts from 2011 to 2015. Um, so in their case, just as I just showed for Rhode Island waters, um, he also did a series of aerial, these are based aerial transects, um, and these transects, you can see the paths of the plane that they were done, um, and so uh, similar survey uh, methods that we did. So we really, and the gray area represents the least block areas, um, and then some of the areas under consideration too for turbines. So we really wanted to get some handle on the distribution of birds that are using these key areas. Um, so he wanted to quantify the distribution of abundance of seabirds, particularly off of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, um, and the, the, particularly the, low, the gray area, which is the Boehm least block. Um, and he was very interested in seasonality, which we also did too, and year yearly variation. And his key point was to really d identify those hot spots of seabird abundance, which we did too in Rhode Island. Um, so his results, he found, based on all this aerial surveys, he found two key areas. Nantucket shoals, where long-tailed ducks, white-winged scoters, terns uh, congregate, a Muskegon Channel, where loons, black scoters, and common eiders and terns also congregate. So here's the, the two areas that were, and, and based on all this, the data where these hot spots really occurred. Um, so Muskegon Channel is a, is a key area, um, and also Nantucket Shoals that I just mentioned a second ago. So one of the things is he was trying to quantify seasonal variation, and you can see that for white-winged scoter, which is a type of sea duck, um, particularly during the spring, you have large numbers of um, white-winged sco scoters congregating um, in these offshore areas. Um, a fair number in, in the fall, winter, all these birds um, breed um, in the tundra zone throughout Canada during the summer months, so they're, not, they're absent during the summer months. If you look at the distribution, so this just shows uh, 
the density of birds per kilometer squared, the larger the circle, the more birds are congregated in, in the area. So you can see that um, in the channel, you get a fair number of birds. And this, this area, too, is kind of a large number of white-winged scoters are congregated in this area. And then the eastern segments of this lease block, you get large numbers of white-winged scoters congregating um, at the edge of Nantucket Shoals. And then long-tailed ducks, um, also large numbers congregating in that area. Um, in the spring, they also migrate far, fairly far north to breed in the summer months and then the fall, and then particularly the winter, you get large numbers of long-tailed ducks um, wintering and staging in this area during spring. So again, the same kind of spatial distribution patterns, they're mainly congregated right at the edge of Nantucket Shoals. The long-tailed ducks is a species that um, dies really deep, feeds on these large amphipods that are found um, in this area. Tim White in her dissertation research also documented the same pattern too. So Nantucket Shoals is a critical area for a lot of sea ducks. Um, and in fact, Boehm took several lease blocks off out of consideration because of the, the importance of this area um, to sea ducks in terms of staging habitat and foraging habitat during the winter months. So some of Dick's take, take home messages is, um, um, and Dick could speak better to this than me, because um, these are his conclusions, but um, he's, he's concerned about using flight height data collected from boats or planes, because um, very often when you do this, aerial surveys are boat-based surveys. It's under relatively good weather conditions when the birds tend to be flying low. Um, and then, so he's saying that on, and on days when there's really strong winds, the birds really tend to fly much higher when they're in the rotor swept zone. So um, ignore much of the flight height data that's collected by other observers. Um, and then his key point is um, when you're presenting data for the distribution of birds, it's really important to include the raw data, the distribution in our reports as he presented in his report. Um, and his point was that arbitrarily conducted ocean data um, can often bias the results for actual distribution of seabirds. So I know that I talked to him about this latter statement and he was concerned about some maps that have been created based on models um, don't really show, show biological reality what the extra distribution of birds are showing. So he was concerned about some of the current models and distribution maps that are being created by some user unknown groups, unknown, unnamed user groups. So thank you. All right, Pam and Scott. Tag team here, you guys can. All right, thanks everybody. My name is Pam Loring. I'm a biologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service Migratory Birds Division. And I'm going to attempt to condense about five years of research that we've done on tracking bird movements offshore into seven minutes. Um, we've done this work with funding from BOEM and in partnership with the University of Rhode Island and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So um, there's an information gap on the offshore movements of some priority bird species that are listed as threatened or endangered under the US Endangered Species Act. Um, these species include the red knot, the piping plover, and the roseate tern. So these species are very um, small bodied. The picture shows a red knot. Um, it weighs about as much as your cell phone. So the technology that's available for tracking them is really limited. So for these studies, we look towards a new type of technology called uh, nanotags for tracking their movements offshore. So um, there's a picture of a nanotag on the far side of the screen, and you can see it relative to um, a penny. So this particular model weighs less than a gram, and it has um, a body of a transmitter that we attach to the back of the bird in between the wings. 
and it has a long antenna that emits signals on a VHF frequency about every five seconds. So to track those signals, we set up um, arrays of highly directional antennas. So this is an antenna array that we set up um, in partnership with the Southeast Lighthouse Foundation on uh, Block Island, right on the grounds of the Southeast Lighthouse. Um, it's 40 feet tall, and it has six antennas um, on top in a radial configuration. Um, those antennas can detect signals of nanotags within about a 20 uh, kilometer radius from the tower. And the signals are logged by a receiving unit that sits at the base of the tower. And it's solar powered, so it can run uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week around the clock. So this map shows our study area. We set up a total of 35 40 foot antenna towers from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, all the way down to Back Bay, Virginia. And the locations of those towers are shown as the black points on the map. And then the different colored polygons show the different um, BOEM lease and planning areas throughout our study area. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of the key findings of our three focal species. Um, a little background, the red knot is a highly migratory shorebird. It breeds in the high Arctic regions of Canada and passes through um, the Atlantic coast during migration. We did all of our work during fall. Uh, during fall migration, it heads to staging areas, um, primarily in the Cape Cod uh, region of Massachusetts. And then there's two different wintering populations, one that's shorter distance that goes down to the Caribbean and southeastern US, and another that's longer distance that goes to sites in Brazil and as far south as um, Tierra del Fuego in the southern reaches of South America. So we tagged um, a total of 98 red knots on Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge uh, off Cape Cod and Chatham, Mass in fall of 16. And we got good data from 76 of them. So this map shows um, the routes that those birds took during their staging uh, period after we tagged them and as they departed on migration. So we found that um, over 90% um, of the knots took an offshore route, likely heading towards Brazil as they departed from Cape Cod. So they headed straight southeast from Cape Cod over the open Atlantic Ocean. Um, and the remaining birds took a route that was more of a shortcut across the Mid-Atlantic Bight um, to staging areas further down in the Mid-Atlantic and then likely headed onward uh, from our study area to the Caribbean or southeastern US. So we found a higher um, exposure to these wind energy areas from the shorter distance migrating red knots relative to the long distance knots that were heading to Brazil. And again, we conducted this work during uh, fall migration only, so it could be different as they head north in the spring. Um, our next species uh, that we looked at was the piping plover. So the piping plover um, is a shorebird that breeds along the Atlantic coast of the US, including right here in Rhode Island uh, during the summer. And they migrate uh, to the wintering areas in the southeastern US and the Caribbean. And there was a really long standing question for piping plovers about how they got from their breeding sites to their wintering areas. Um, primarily, do they fly offshore or do they take a coastal route? So we tagged birds um, in both Massachusetts off of Cape Cod and in Rhode Island. And this map shows the migratory routes of um, 28 piping plovers from each tagging area. So the birds in Rhode Island are shown in green, the birds in Massachusetts are shown in red. And we found that although some of the piping plovers appeared to hug the coast as they headed south, primarily from nesting areas in Rhode Island, many of them were quite willing to launch um, straight across the ocean in that shorter distance, but potentially more uh, risky flight crossing the open ocean to get to staging areas down in the mid-Atlantic. So this was really pretty exciting information for these, uh, this species. Um, the last species that we looked at was the roseate tern. Uh, the roseate tern is an endangered seabird that nests in islands um, throughout the north, northwest Atlantic and pretty select um, nesting areas. And they winter down in uh, South America, in Brazil, and um, down towards Argentina. So the roseate tern um, always nests in association with a non-federally um, listed but very similar species called the common tern. And folks that are um, from the fishing community here probably recognize um, 
these uh, species of seabirds because they often associate with striped bass and bluefish off our coast in the summer. Um, so the terns are unique in that they nest on these islands and they use offshore environments for um, finding food to feed themselves and their young throughout the nesting period. And then they all travel to staging areas. Um, Cape Cod is a very well-known staging area in our, air, in our region before heading south on migration. So we have quite a lot of data from how they move throughout the study area. So instead of doing linear maps, I made a movie of the data. So um, do you want me to go press the button or is there somebody? Yeah. So hopefully it'll work. So we did the tagging on Great Gull Island in Eastern Long Island Sound, kind of in the race area. It worked when we tested it, so. <laughs> And I have the hard copy of the movie on the computer too, so that might work outside of PowerPoint. All right, perfect. So during the breeding period when we tagged them, they had chicks, and they spent a lot of time traveling from sites uh, ranging from the nesting colony all the way out to Block Island, which is about 50 kilometers away. So now we're getting into the post-breeding period in July and August, and a lot of the terns are heading out to uh, the Cape and Islands. Um, so there's really important sand lance resources just right off Cape Cod, and it's thought that uh, most of the terns from the the nesting populations um, throughout the northeast stage on Cape Cod before heading south to Brazil. So we have a lot of movement data on our, on our focal species, which is really, really exciting. Um, and currently we're doing a big analysis on um, offshore flights relative to covariates that are um, important for looking at exposure and collision risk modeling. So those include the altitude of the flights, which is data that we can model from the signal strength of the, um, the transmitters as they're flying through our array of receiving stations. We're looking at timing of flights, both um, during the day, are they occurring primarily by day or night, and throughout the course of the um, season. We're looking at demographic information from our tagged birds, so age, sex, um, reproductive success. And we're looking at a variety of weather covariates that associate with um, collision risk modeling. So um, are they flying during good visibility conditions or during fog, um, during stormy weather, or during nice weather, and things like that. Um, so another exciting um, expansion to this project has been the installation of a new tracking station right on one of the, the turbines off of Block Island. So this is a picture um, of John O'Keefe of Deepwater Wind. Uh, installing antennas on the on the turbine foundation. So we're super excited and grateful to be partnering with Deepwater Wind on this effort. It's a project that's really spearheaded by URI and um, the, the installation was done this fall and we've actually done some calibration flights where we took out a boat, we flew a, a fishing kite um, from the back of the boat that had a transmitter attached to it. Um, so we have a lot of data on what the signal strength looks like around the station that will be um, used in our modeling efforts, and we'll be, we'd be doing a lot more of that uh, starting next year as well. So thanks, everybody, and look forward to the questions in the panel. Oh, that's not me. So uh, my name is Scott Johnson. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Division of Migratory Birds. And, and uh, just a couple of uh, quick comments, I think, before I start is um, I think Peter did a great job, I think, of exploring uh, a lot of the issues that, that we've learned in, in Europe. And so trying to then apply that on our own coast is, I think, a part of what um, you know we've just been uh, presented with here um, so far. And then even going further with uh, some of Dick Veet's uh, conclusions about 
you know, which um, you could take as, as a don't rely on, you know, one uh, method of, of, uh, of research. And, and so I think that's one of the things that, uh, that we just uh, heard Pam talk about is, is uh, uh, it, you know, in addition to the boat-based, aerial-based surveys, now we have nanotag. I'm going to talk about uh, one other project and then also a database that we're working on. And so um, what I also want to add to that is that that's something that we've been working with BOEM for uh, many years, over 10 years now. We've had a great collaboration with them. And they've listened to, to these issues. You know, when it first, uh, when offshore wind first started to be uh, discussed, you know, we, we had a conversation with them and said, we don't really know a lot of what's going on with, uh, with birds um, in the offshore environment. And uh, they were very willing to help, and they've just been... Uh, tremendous partners uh, of ours. So I mean, a huge, a huge thanks to uh, to Bohm. Uh, I think for that collaboration. It was kind of funny because listening to all the presentations yesterday, I thought we had a very special relationship with Bohm, but apparently <laughs> we're not the only ones. So I'm, you know, I'm not feeling quite as special as I as I uh, as I as I thought I I, I was. But I, I don't feel betrayed. But it's you know. Uh, it, it is what it is. So, uh, but it, it, obviously that's that's wonderful to uh, uh, to see that, um, and uh, it's been extremely uh, fruitful on our part. Uh, and of course, and, and that was talked about a lot yesterday. I think was this issue of partnerships, right? So that's been something that's been really critical uh, in our bird work. And and uh, so a few of the partners were just mentioned. A couple of others uh, related to this diving bird uh, project. Uh, using uh, satellite telemetry. Again, yet another uh, method to try to understand uh, where the birds are, what the distribution and abundance uh, are. Uh, BRI, USGS, and Memorial uh, were huge partners of ours um, on this project. So just a few slides. I'm kind of more going into the results and not a lot on the, um, the um, uh, how we got the data necessarily. But again, uh, this is the kind of information that we need to be, be able to make decisions around where turbines need to be sited, what the potential impacts might be. So from the satellite tag uh, work, we, um, is that the pointer? Oh yeah. Um, so we, we were able to um, uh, understand, at least for one of the high priority species, northern gannet uh, winter use, so where the birds are hanging out during the winter uh, in relation to some of these wind air areas. And, and red means higher concentration, basically, at least uh, uh, during the winter. So these are, uh, these are some of the areas you can see. Uh, all their breeding areas are up uh, off of Newfoundland, and so this is where they're, they're spending uh, their winter. There's substantial population that goes down into the, into the Gulf as well. Uh, surf scoter, one of the other uh, species too. Here's the uh, distribution then uh, during winter again, and, and again how it's. Uh, by the way, um, I don't know if we saw a lot of data with some of the other species, but um, huge numbers uh, of birds that are uh, going into the bays during uh, during winter as well. Not an issue obviously for offshore wind, but certainly a, a huge conservation uh, issue as we're studying um, studying these species. But you can see. Um, the uh, the winter use for at least uh, the shorebird or for the uh, for the scoters. I work on shorebirds too, so sometimes I get caught up in <laughs> calling a marine bird a a, a shorebird. Uh, nobody else probably cares about that. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's like a real bird thing, isn't it? Yeah, they're all like. Yeah, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, so the other, um, the other part I think that's uh, that's really critical about uh, about this work, in addition to the the nano tag, is that it does give uh, you an idea of what not only what the winter use might be or uh, breeding uh, uh, use of of an area, but also what the migratory patterns might be. So at least for northern gannet in the fall migration, here was some heavy use that we found uh, again um, as a way to um, uh, to try to determine. Um, uh, where they're where they are and where the uh, potential um, potential impacts might be, and then uh, let's see. I think I'm ending with a. And then this was a, a really cool one uh, for the red-throated loon. Um, is a, a really interesting distribution just from kind of a a, a cool uh, thing similar to red knots being able to fly. What was it? Eight days straight. I think they can migrate all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. Amazing. They weigh as much as a cell phone. Well, similar. Here with the red-throated loon again, um, you know, m uh, migratory patterns. We're seeing them largely hugging, you know, relatively close to the um, uh, to the coastline. But then once they make, it, you know, there's a little bit uh, across um, uh, across the uh, mid-Atlantic here, straight up to their breeding grounds uh, up in the Arctic, uh, Canada. Uh, but here's a um, 
Here's a, a really interesting to see um, how widespread some of these birds are. Uh, the, you know, we tagged all these birds down in the mid-Atlantic, and here's one that went up and, and bred in Greenland, too. So the conservation uh, issues that we're facing or, or that we're uh, discovering is, is, uh, is really quite, uh, quite remarkable. And then uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about then is, uh, so where does, where does all this information go? And I think we, in the last panel, I think somebody was accused of having a bunch of files down in their basement. Well, this has been a, a long, uh, long uh, concern of ours and, and Bohm's, uh, where we wanted to make sure that all the data that we had on uh, uh, water birds and, and marine birds could be put in one central location. So we, uh, we developed what's called the Northwest Atlantic Seabird Catalog. And this is a catalog of all the information that we've been able to get. And literally, we have gone to people's houses and uh, offices and grabbed cartons out of their basements, many of them clinging you know, hard to not losing their data and be able to put that into the um, uh, into this uh, database, and, and Bohm has been supporting a couple of positions to um, a database manager, and then also a statistician for uh, for several years. Um, so, the, and uh, also of note here is that we're not just uh, uh, putting in bird data there with um, with particularly with the aerial surveys. Uh, we're seeing a lot of other, or we're recording um, other um, uh, other observations, including marine mammals, sea turtles. Uh, bats, uh, bugs, which is a technical term, uh, boats, and uh, marine debris, uh, which uh, actually a lot of their, uh, maybe that's true for other people that are doing observations, we're seeing a lot of marine debris, particularly uh, balloons, for example. Um, so that's uh, something we're, um, is a part of the database as well. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about how some of the, the data is collected, and again, it kind of goes to that issue of multiple uh, methods. And, uh, and so this is a, a little bit on uh, survey effort. And, and before anyone gets too concerned uh, to think that, that uh, you know, birds only are distributed in, in straight lines uh, like this in the offshore, this just represents the, the, um, the track of a, of a boat where an observation was made. I remember the first time I, I saw that, I rather stupidly was thinking, wait, I didn't think birds really occurred in straight lines out offshore. Are you, are you sure that's, that's correct? And they, uh, so anyways, this is a, this is, if you're uh, interested in a particular area, then you can go after survey effort, how much effort there was, uh, what sort of survey effort it, um, but either, either boat-based or, or aerial. And then uh, not only is it uh, useful for offshore wind, it's also critical to understand what the potential uh, impacts might be of, a, of an oil spill, too. We've used this uh, information down in, I think that's in South Carolina, isn't it? Or North Carolina. Um, of uh, sensitivity uh, for a potential oil spill. So there's a huge uh, amount of use uh, that can be made out of, uh, out of the database. And I think that was, oh yeah, that's right. So then the whole idea then is to try to um, you know, make, an ob or make an understanding of the distribution and abundance. So this is one species, a quarry shearwater, uh, where you can see the, uh, the uh, distribution. Um, and let's see, I can't even remember if, if uh, I, I'm gonna have to get a little bit closer. Winter on the right and, and uh, summer on the right, but any or uh, winter and summer, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, uh, but uh, what's important is that this is the kind of information that you can get that we we are now getting out of the out of the database. It's presence and abundance. Presence and abundance. Of course, I knew that, Peter. I was just <laughs> testing everybody. That's all. <laughs> Thanks. Shows you how much I studied the slides beforehand, right? Um, and so here's my contact information. Uh, please let me know if you have any other questions. And, and thanks very much to uh, Jen for organizing this session, too. I really appreciate it. Thank you.
Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, Bob Roy wishes that he could be here. He had a family emergency that he needed to leave for, so I am filling in for him for this morning. Um, and I am going to talk a little bit about the avian and bat monitoring that has actually happened at Block Island. I'll go ahead and jump to the spoilers now. We've heard lots and lots of results of specific pieces. And if this were happening, say, in six months to a year, we might have more to share. Um, but I'm going to be primarily talking about the types of surveys that we've done um, and in a year or so, we'll have more information to talk about. Um, so if we look specifically at Block Island, the permits, the environmental permits were received in 2014, and much of the permitting was, not much of it, but certainly part of the permitting was based on some of the pre-construction surveys that were done um, based on the avian and bat surveys to inform what the potential risk was. And then the post-construction surveys that are currently ongoing um, are informed by the conditions from the, both the Army Corps and the CRMC permits that were um, sent permits that were issued. So if we look at the pre-construction surveys, I'm not going to list out all of the ones that you can hear, but you can see that there's a wide variety of types of surveys. Many are very similar to the surveys that were just described in detail. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's a lesson learned is that the technology is continually evolving, and certainly the nanotag surveys that Pam mentioned, we didn't have those technologies, you know, seven to ten years ago, um, and so that was not something that was available for those type of species. But those surveys were conducted from 2009 to 2011, and they evaluated some of the potential risk uh, to both birds and bats. And then the post-construction surveys that are currently ongoing, we are, complete, we are nearing the completion of the year one surveys that have been conducted um, for those, and those reports will be available in spring 2018. I should say that there is no data sitting in my basement or in Stantec's basement for any of this, and certainly I should have mentioned for the pre-construction surveys, um, all of that data Deepwater had provided um, to US Fish and the other agencies, and I believe some of that has been incorporated into the portal. I'm not sure if it is all there or not. Um, but certainly that's the intent. And those surveys have included um, bat acoustic monitoring that occurred on the construction vessels during construction, as well as onshore beached bird surveys, both during construction um, and operation, offshore avian surveys off of boats, and then a turbine-mounted radar and camera collision monitoring um, piece. Those are the pieces that were as part of the post-construction plan as part of the permitting. And in addition, uh, there has also been turbine-mounted bat and avian acoustic monitoring in addition to the nanotag uh, surveys that Pam mentioned. So if we look at the different types of surveys that have been done, with acoustic monitoring, there were bat acoustic detectors that were placed on the jack-up barges during the installation in 2016. And you can see the orange, uh, the orange arrows show where those deployments were located. Um, those were about 200 to 300 feet from the, from above the water level, um, and that's based on the 90 foot lift up that needed, the transition piece that needed to happen. Um, in addition, you can see this is, this is what the acoustic detectors look like in these two locations. So it's a small unit with a microphone that's depicting what's happening. The onshore beached bird surveys happened off of three beaches in Block Island. Um, these happened both pre-construction and then um, during both construction and post-construction. The red and the blue show that there were some um, variations made in sort of the locations of where those occurred. They occurred twice per month um, during year one, and then it'll be repeated again during year three. And then boat-based surveys were also conducted. These were conducted pre-construction, and then the same protocol and the same transects were used for post-construction. Um, they're conducted once a month in years one. We've just completed the first survey last week, uh, the, the last survey of year one last week, and will be repeated in year three. And those surveys include both an a morning survey and then an afternoon survey, and the uh, transects basically go from off of, oop, whoa. Um, 
starting off of Block Island, continuing through an area where there are no turbines, along the turbines, and then another area off the turbines. Um, so while it's not, I'm not sure that we would call it specifically a control area, it does, it will, um, the expectation is that it will provide some information about any dif uh, dis differences in abundance and distribution between where the turbines are located and where there are no turbines. Um, these surveys, very similar to the ones we heard about earlier, provide information about all of the birds that are identified um, in that area, and um, there has been no analysis yet. I should also mention that these surveys were conducted um, using a boat that's based out of Block Island um, the, for both the pre- and the post-construction surveys, the Lindsay E. And then the other Part of the post-construction program has been the collision monitoring um, and the avian radar system. And this is based on using what's called MUSE, or multi-sensor wildlife detection system. And that's a next generation system of a system that's been used in Europe for several years at several systems. That system is called the TADS, Thermal Animal Detection System. Um, and that is deployed, will be deployed for years one and three per the plan, but it really needs to be operational continuously. So it basically um, is, will be running continuously and will be able to collect data from that, for that. Um, it is a, it's an S-band radar, you can, oop, buttons. Um, it's an S-band radar that's located here and then that operates as well a camera system that can both um, point, zoom, and tilt. Um, and so when there is a target that's detected near in the airspace, basically between turbines one and three, um, it can get additional information about that. Those files are then stored and can be analyzed um, in more detail to understand a little bit more about what's happening. And this is it. another picture of the same system. This is not, this is the one picture from the side that's not from Block Island. So this is a picture of that system um, at one of the sites in Europe. And that radar data can also be evaluated to identify sort of general information about avian use in the area. And then if we think about some of the lessons learned from, from this system, I think one of the things that's um, been particularly interested, uh, interesting for us, and I think for many of the surveys that we saw yesterday as well, is that thinking about the deployment and the logistics is certainly more complicated um, and different than onshore type surveys. Um, you know, I've been involved in a variety of onshore surveys for wind projects for probably for over 10 years, and it often involves you know putting together a truck, sending out some text, getting some stuff involved, and the Logistics involved when you're working in the offshore environment are much more significant. Um, it involves a lot more training and safety and certifications. That's something we haven't talked a whole lot about, but um, it's certainly something that you need to be aware of. And as we mentioned, the weather conditions, particularly for the boat surveys, um, from a safety perspective, you need to make sure you're doing them at the appropriate times. Um, and from the weather, that adds to that issues, and certainly I think we saw that this fall as we were scheduling those surveys um, with the various hurricanes and wind storms that happened, particularly in one of the months, you know, we ended up having a very narrow window in which we could get those, um, get those surveys done. And I also think we rec we've recognized, and I think we have certainly appreciated that um, Deepwater has been willing to figure out how to make these turbines really a platform of opportunity for additional surveys. Um, we saw that with the nanotag surveys, and then you know we've also uh, placed acoustic detectors that are detecting both bats and birds on those turbines, um, and we'll have information about what that first year of, of uh, what that first year of data collection will look like, um, and that's certainly a um, a piece that will really become much more to come once we get those results from year one. So that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we've got about six or seven minutes for questions, or maybe a little bit longer than that. Let's say we have 10 minutes for questions. So um, questions, yes, sir. Questions, sir? Yeah. 
So the question to Pam was about uh, cruising altitude and tra tra trajectories. It varies by species. So we know that the terns tend to fly at relatively low altitudes, um, below 30 meters or so, um, typically. And the shorebirds spend a lot of time um, on the ground or making sort of low altitude flights um, during the, the nesting period and during staging. But we know that when they migrate, they reach um, much higher altitudes uh, for cruising. And that's something that we can see from the data within our tracking array because there's a relationship between the range at which our equipment can detect the VHF signals and how high the bird is flying uh, with the tag. So oftentimes when we see shorebirds depart on migration, they're getting detected on stations that are as far apart as 180 kilometers. Um, so by sort of all the sites in the array. So we're working now with modelers um, at UMass Amherst and a new collaboration with folks here at URI to try to better describe that relationship. Um, it's very much a work in progress. The two-dimensional is much easier than the three-dimensional. But that will all be available in the final report. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Sir. So the question to Pam was on uh, flight heights and inclement weather. Yeah, we haven't um, we haven't quite teased that out apart, and we're still trying to get a handle on what the the resolution is of our altitude data. Um, but we have seen some interesting patterns with uh, movement with respect to weather. So for the red dot data that we analyzed, there was a strong indication that they were waiting to depart on those long distance and short distance migrations for good. Um, conditions, so good visibility, um, a t some wind support with a tailwind. Um, and we find, too, with the turns that they, um, I did some work with my with a, a chapter in my dissertation where we looked at turn movements as they were departing from um, their uh, nesting areas in Long Island Sound to staging areas on the Outer Cape. And we found that um, when a big storm came through and wiped out a lot of the nests at the nesting colony, uh, combined with low food availability at the nesting colony, a lot of the turns um, moved during more inclement weather. So there's a lot of different factors going on, but it does seem like if they have a choice and all things being equal, they choose the better conditions for flying. All right, thank you. Sir. So we've heard a lot about birds, but how about more about bats? I'll talk a little. Joy. Is it on? Is it on? Okay. It's on. I'll talk a little bit about it, and then I can also, um, I will point out my colleague, Steve Pelletier, who's in the audience, who has worked on um, several years of research. We've done some studies that have been funded both by BOEM and DOE, sort of looking at that very question, um, and have identified, you know, there certainly is some bat presence, and I think that's one of the interesting things about having the surveys that we have done, um, you know, ancillary to Block Island, looking at both the turbines and then the construction vessels to really understand a little bit more detail what is there. And so I think we don't, we don't know a whole lot. We do know that they are out there. Um, and I think that's something that we'll have more information about in the next year or so. All right. We no, are, no data, I just have to repeat, there's no data yet on bats? Um, All birds? So for Block Island, we're finishing year one spring. of the survey. And so once we finish that, we'll complete the analysis, go through all the process of that, and then it'll be released in the spring. Um, so those surveys were just, uh, the, those transects were just on the western edge of Nantucket Shoals. Um, but for what I know, the birds are, are spread um, over most of Nantucket Shoals, both those species. 
So, but those, those fronts and those areas where the, there's upwelling is definitely areas where the birds are concentrated too. Other questions? Yes, sir. This is a, a general question, but maybe for Peter. Um, is anyone looking at bird activity, uh, for example, say northern gannets, and fisheries activity, the correlation of them together? Say, northern gannets and the Atlantic herring fishery or Atlantic herring migration. So the question was about the correlation between uh, birds such as northern gannets and fisheries such as uh, herring. Um, well, we know that th that just based on our aerial surveys um, in the Rhode Island Stamp area that the gannets were definitely concentrated where there was fishing activity and particularly when they're pulling up stuff that you get a lot of gannets in those areas. Um, but as, uh, as far as I know, there hasn't um, been any concerted effort to compile, bring those two groups together. And we did hear briefly from Pam that we saw our correlation between uh, probably bass and bluefish yeah, and uh, common terns that are chasing, chasing well, they're all chasing the same bait fish. Yeah, and there's been studies um, conducted over the years looking at, you know, the associations between um, birds and fish and uh, marine mammals. Holly Goyert is here and did some really cool work for her dissertation looking at that. So there's a lot of sort of piecemeal studies um, out there, um, but there's also a lot of really interesting data that could be used for a more comprehensive analysis as well. So a lot, a lot of opportunity to expand. And I will maybe add to that a little bit, but as we're looking at, um, at, at siting and projects, I think that sort of part of what happens when you're looking at are there possibilities of abundance and distribution, certainly we have the great information that's in the portal and the atlas, but also sort of not looking at just the birds, but also what are the fisheries that are there and can we make any um, findings from that. I think one of the things you have to be careful of, as we heard yesterday though, is that certainly that changes year to year. And so I think we wouldn't wanna be conclusive about that, but I think it's certainly something that we're looking at um, as we look at siting of projects. Any other questions? So the question is on motion centers and red lights that go off, and that would probably a, be a bad idea for birds? Uh, no, I don't think so, because the, bird, the lights are attracting, the, white, the steady white lights are attracting the birds to the, the, whatever the infrastructure is. So the flashing lights do less attraction. So no lights would be, there would be little attraction to the bird. So that would be but fine. Well, the blinking red lights are less attractive than the steady red lights. And the FAA requires lights on, on, the, on the infrastructure. So there has to be some type of light to notify pilots. Right. And your question about having no lights, I think that's an, a question for the FAA. Um, <laughs> All right, <yeah>. thank you. <laughs> I mean, All right. There's a big, I can just tell you, there's a big push right now. There's, thousands of communication towers across North America with steady red lights or white lights. And there's a big push by the conservation community to get rid of all, all those and convert those to, to blinking red lights to minimize impacts on bird populations. So it's a huge issue. All right, thank you. Um, final question, I'll have the final question for Scott Johnston. Um, we should have called this birds, bats, and bugs. You mentioned <laughs> bugs, but you left it hanging. Uh, what about bugs in the offshore environment? Uh, not my department. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. I have no clue. Okay. Thank you for all of our panelists. Let's give them a.
Dave. So because of the computer issues, we're just putting your slides up first, but you're still talking last. Is there something in that? Yeah, that's what I thought. Perfect. All right. Are you guys ready to go? All right. Because of the computer issues, we're pulling up Dave's slides now, even though they're all right, folks, we're going to get started on our last panel before lunch. Thank you for joining us this morning. For those who I don't know, I'm Tiffany Smythe. I work here at the Coastal Resources Center in Rhode Island Sea Grant, and I am glad to welcome you all here to the Bay Campus for this event. Um, this morning's panel, I'm really happy to be leading this panel. We're going to be shifting gears away from natural science and, and hearing more social observations about what folks have been experiencing living and working near, uh, living, working, and playing near the wind farm. Um, my panelists, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves in more depth shortly, but briefly, are Jessica Willie, Chris Willie. Judy Gray, and Dave Monty. And I'm really fortunate because I've been working with these folks for a lot of the past year, I'd say, on some research that we're doing here at CRC and Sea Grant, funded by Bohm, on the wind farm. And you'll be hearing more about that this afternoon. So come back after lunch. Um, I do want to point out that we've been talking about Block Island for a day and a half now, but we haven't yet heard from Block Islanders. And so I'm very happy to say that we will be hearing from Block Islanders on our panel shortly. And I want to acknowledge that we have a few other Block Islanders lurking around in the audience. Um, we have Kim Gaffett, Brian Wilson, and Bill Pell. And if we have time, oh, someone, Penn, sorry, sorry, Bill. Just met Bill half an hour ago. Uh, <laughs> but we're very happy to have you here. And uh, if we have time at the end of our panel, we'll invite them into the conversation if they're interested. Um, what I have learned about working with both Block Islanders and fishermen, we have both on our panel, is that they all seem to wear many hats. Um, maybe it's because it's windy, I don't know. But because of that, I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves in a bit more detail and explain their various roles and affiliations um, and experiences with regard to the wind farm. So I'd like each of you to... Um, in a moment, speak, uh, introduce yourselves, but then also share some of your initial experiences with the wind farm. We'll give each of you about five minutes to do that. Um, and then I'll pose a few questions to our panel that relate to their experiences, what they've learned, what advice they'd like to share, and then we'll open it up to everyone else. All right? So with that, I'd love to start with Jessica. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Jessica Willey. I'm the executive director of the Block Island Tourism Council. I'm also a year-round Block Island resident. I sit on the school committee on Block Island, and I'm married to Chris Willey. And <laughs> we have two kids. I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> what are you going to say? <laughs> I'm used to it. Yeah. So um, I, I think that's it for me. Um, so I've, well, I've been with the Tourism Council for 10 years, um, so about as long as this project's been um, being worked on, um, and initial um, sort of day-to-day -day observations of, um, you know, the wind farm coming from a, a tourism council's perspective is that um, the, wind, the wind farm affects, um, I think, residents a lot more than it affects tourism um, in, in the end, but um, that I think tourism is an extremely should be a, a big part of the conversation. So those are my just initial sort of thoughts on um, on the turbines and turbines and uh, living on Block Island. From our from where we live, we don't um, we can't see them from our home on Block Island. So. Uh, my name is Christopher Willie. Uh, I am a URI grad, 1993 wildlife biology. It's important to note. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I own Block Island Fish Works, which is a, a, it's a tackle shop, bait and tackle shop. Uh, I have a charter boat business. We run two boats. Um, we do that for pretty much six months out of the year. Uh, I am into the first year sitting on the town council. I also sat on the school committee. Uh, I've lived on Block Island since 1992. Um, and my initial thoughts on the win or my overall thoughts on the wind farm, you're talking to a proponent of it. 
Um, so that may skew or bias some of the things that I say, but I was a proponent of it when it was started 10 years ago. Um, and I think it is a good thing. Um, I've enjoyed watching them being built, particularly because we're on the water every single day. And the engineering behind it is fascinating. Um, it's impressive. Um, my uh, disappointment, the only disappointment, would be at the local level. As Jess said, um, this affects Block Island residents more than Block Island tourism, per se, I think. I think she's right. <coughs> um, but from a local resident perspective, there were some disappointments that I think everybody can learn from as communities move forward with these projects up and down the East Coast. Finding out after the fact how many of these wind farms are actually, or areas are being you know, set aside, lease, lease areas are being set aside, um, this is a perfect opportunity, this particular project, for those communities to take all the data that's being collected now and kind of make the process a better one. I should mention that Chris and Jessica just flew over this morning for the explicit purpose of joining us, so thank you for that. Hi, I'm uh, Judy Gray. I'm a uh, year-round resident on Block Island now. Um, I, I moved there in 2011, so I, and I'm the, uh, a retired meteorologist from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, mostly working on weather research. And I'm the vice president of the Block Island Maritime Institute, which provides educational programs for summer residents and student and uh, visitors. Um, because I moved to Block Island partway through the process, I got a, a chance to observe the process from afar. I've owned the home, my home there for 20 years. And so when the surveys were going out to residents and people like myself who had owned a home but didn't live there year-round, I can say that I felt very involved in the process. So I you know, lived in Miami, and I can't even tell you how many surveys I filled out. Seemed like it was the same one multiple times, but, uh, uh, but happily uh, took every opportunity to participate in the process. Once I moved to the island, I became very active in attending as many meetings as possible, both in the mainland and on the island, and was uh, really impressed with the willingness of deep water wind to come out in the winter and the worst of weather. I think that Aileen, you were out there one time and I, I, mean, I was surprised anyone showed up for the meeting at all at the rescue barn. I thought we were all gonna have to be rescued. Um, but uh, uh, I really felt um, uh, gratified by the process. I think the town council did an excellent job of uh, keeping me as a distant resident and then as a local resident informed of what they knew what was going on. And uh, uh, I think that uh, a lot of what was said yesterday by the fishermen about attend every, try, it's hard to attend every meeting, I, I kind of felt that same sort of meeting fatigue eventually as a resident, but uh, still encourage um, those, that kind of attendance. I'm very concerned with the uh, number of projects that are currently in, um, in being speculated about or being determined in that Part of what made me feel good about the process was I personally what felt involved. And I'm not sure I would have had that same felt feeling of connection if I'd been working through a representative. And so I think a big challenge for the upcoming projects is to help people like me or an individual fisherman feel connected to the project. The, the amount of communication that's required for that I think is, is very important to be considered. I think the social science that's going on right now around Block Island Wind Farm can be helpful in, um, in creating uh, the processes so that I as an individual, even though I'm not maybe direct, speaking directly to the deep water wind folks, but I, that I have a trusted representative and that I still feel that kind of connection. Um, I, I also wanted to say something about um, the power on Block Island. Um, one of the things that's really good about the Black Island Wind Farm is that it was a very small community that came out yesterday um, that we are very directly impacted. My electric bills have gone down, can't speak for anyone else, but mine are lower. Uh, 
And one of the biggest financial impacts for me is that the power is clean for the first time. Um, appliances are becoming more and more electronic. And uh, so my washing machine, which is all a mechanical, it, what it, I mean, I'm never going to get rid of that thing it, it, because when the power was being generated by, um, by the um, uh, generators. generators, thank you, I, my clocks never kept time. And as I put new appliances into my home, they'd burn out in like five years. So, uh, it's because of the electronics. And, and I, my dishwasher lasted less than five years. It probably was used 50 times. And, uh, and it, the guy who came in to look at it said it's cheaper to buy a new one than to replace the electronics on this older one. Uh, the other thing I really want to touch on is light pollution. Um, um, a, a good friend of mine is very, very anti-wind farm because she overlooks the wind farm and she lost what she considered her dark sky. I think that dark sky considerations are really important. I like the idea of having over the horizon wind farms so that we don't see those lights from up. But she, she made a comment uh, on NBC News that it was like looking at JFK. And since I look over the Block Island Airport as well as the wind farm, um, I can tell you it's not even as bright as the Block Island Airport, <laughs> much less JFK. But I do think that these dark sky considerations are important for, to people, and it is something that came out of our community that I think is important to notice, to mention. Go ahead. Thanks, Judy. Go ahead, Dave. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Monty, and I'm a charter captain and fishing guide, but I'm also a fishing journalist. Uh, I write for uh, about 15 to 20 different uh, daily newspapers, um, uh, weekly newspapers, sport fishing magazines, um, and I'm also very much a recreational uh, fisherman. I'm a member of the Charter and Party Boat Association. Our president, Rick Bellavance, presented uh, yesterday um, and worked with uh, Deep Water Wind uh, in terms of developing a marketing initiative uh, in part due to mitigation funds that we had received for the charter fishing industry. So I was engaged early with the SAMP program and uh, with Deep Water Wind through my charter fishing association. But I must say that I'm also uh, engaged, as I said, as a recreational fisherman and I'm a vice president of something called the uh, Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers. And the anglers have an education mission of uh, um, working uh, with uh, adult anglers as well as children, where every single month we have a, uh, a workshop, and we've talked about the wind farms. We have anywhere from uh, 150 to 250 people attend on uh, things like climate change as well as uh, uh, how, to, how to catch fish. Uh, but we also are very much engaged with youth, where we have youth fishing camp, uh, and we partner with DEM on that. We take 300 inner city kids fishing each year on 60 volunteer boats. So I'm very much involved in the fishing community through my writing, through the charter fishing uh, organization, as well as uh, the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers. Uh, and I, I separate sort of the charter fishing from the recreational fishing because when you look at recreational fishing in Rhode Island, it has an annual economic impact of about $332 million, and that includes both charter fishing and private anglers. And that's a, the most recent NOAA study on economic impact of, uh, of fishing. So it is a, a formidable uh, uh, industry, and it is quite different from commercial fishing. Commercial fishing, the objective is uh, pounds of fish to uh, bring to market for sale, to earn a living, to provide seafood for all of us. And I certainly understand that and appreciate that. But recreational fishing is experiential, that people go recreational fishing for the experience. In fact, the American Sport Fishing Association has spent years of uh, research on why recreational people go fishing. And oddly enough, catching fish is probably like the third or fourth reason. The, the primary reason uh, you, is to be outside, to be outdoors. The second reason is to spend time with family and friends. And, Chris knows this from the charters that he takes, I'm sure. So there's that uh, camaraderie that builds, uh, creating a lifetime of uh, memories, uh, fishing together, that sort of thing. And then usually to catch fish is usually the third or fourth reason. Of course, that varies depending on the fishing trip. I certainly take charters out, and the whole objective is to catch fish. <laughs> so um, I, I say that because to set the table for this comment, and that is, is the Block Island Wind Farm 
has an ex enhanced the experience of recreational anglers immensely from a couple of different perspectives. One, because uh, I feel uh, that it is a fish attractant, and, it, it, and you could see this photo that we have here uh, with the boats fishing out of the wind farm. Before the wind farm was built, there'd be about 25 boats on any given day in the wind farm area. In the peak of the summer season, there are 75 to 100 uh, vessels uh, in, in that area. And could you change the slide slowly? Could someone? Uh, in fact, this was last week. We were, uh, not even a week ago, we were cod fishing at the wind farm. And you can see these angles. You might go through slowly. Uh, you could see that face, sort of a happy face. <laughs> the ne next, if you would, more happy faces from the summer, catching sea bass and flounder. Please keep going. Another happy face, that's Mike Wade of Warchell Outfitters, if you could just keep going with them. More happy anglers. And uh, of course, this is what a charter captain loves, is uh, you know, to be with a happy customer to catch some great, uh, great fish. And one more, and I think that's it. So I wanted to share that with you. No one uh, catches a fish and is sad. They're always happy. <laughs> whether, whether you're seven years old or 70, uh, 70 years old, and this is the point I'm getting at. Recreational fishing is all uh, about the experience, and I think the wind farm has truly enhanced it. Uh, I was fishing with those gentlemen for codfish last week. Uh, they looked over at the wind farm. We were about three miles from it on the east fishing grounds initially, and I said, we like to see the wind farm. Well, you can see the wind farm right there. No, we want to go up to the wind farm. So uh, it, it has created uh, great curiosity, and, um, uh, and it has added to my fishing experience as a recreational fisherman, as well as uh, those that I take fishing. Thank you. There we go. So um, we've got a lot of topics that we're going to come back to in this conversation, I hope. To get us started, I'm hoping we can return to the experience of Black Island residents, um, just because it's one we haven't heard much about the past couple of days. And Jessica and Chris, uh, you, you made some brief comments, as did you, Judy. I'm wondering if we can talk more, hear from each of you, about your experience individually or what you've seen from others in terms of how this experience has affected you and your friends as a Block Island resident. Jessica, why don't we start with you? Um, I think, I think there's a lot of, um, there were a lot of unknowns. So that was, that was sort of a, a big thing when people would say, you know, well, how do you feel about this as a resident? Um, I know Chris said he was a proponent. I, um, to start, was probably not a proponent of the wind farm. Um, I definitely don't think I knew enough about it going into the whole process to know if I was going to be a proponent. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely very divisive, or it had been very divisive on the island with, uh, with residents um, and friends and neighbors. Um, you know, a lot of people were very concerned about view shed. Um, a lot of people that were residents were very concerned about their power bills. Um, and generally those were two separate things. So either you were concerned about your power bills or you were concerned about your view shed. One, one of those things was more important to you than the other. Um, probably you were concerned about your view shed because you were concerned about your real estate. Um, but I think as, a, as somebody who lives on Block Island um, and, and is, you know, affected daily, you know, by this, um, still a point of contention, still, you know, there's still people who, who really don't like them. And, um, you know, and that's, that's to be expected. And, and I think it's important now that most people, I think for the most part, have, you know, they're there. We're learning a ton from them. We're, we're learning a lot about process. I think there's a lot of things that could have been done differently um, as a resident. Um, I, th I do think a lot of, um, I, I consider myself a younger isler islander, <laughs> but um, I don't know that I am, but I sort of consider myself as of the younger group of uh, sort of young families and um, who are just sort of starting to get involved in the town and, um, you know, going back 10 years, I, don't feel like we were involved at all, and maybe that a lot of that is, you know, I'm not talking on a tourism 
perspective because I will talk about that later, but as just an island resident who, who was there all the time, I don't recall filling out any surveys. Maybe one I got in the mail. Um, I know I went to one meeting. Um, so I, I, I just think there was a lot of unknowns. Um, I don't think it's affected people as much as they thought it was going to. I, there's still a lot of confusion. People still don't know if the, uh, is, is the island actually being 100% powered by wind or is it not? Or, you know, how does, it, how does the energy flow to the main? There's still so many questions. And when one person says, you know, we're 100% green, we're 100% powered by wind energy, then the person next to you says, well, no, we're not. That's not true. And nobody, you know, the communication with, on the island itself is sort of um, lacking still. So I know all that stuff's coming. Um, and the, just as, a, as an island resident, those are the things that um, are, I think are talked about most. One is, is view shed and sort of the experience, and the other is, um, is power. And I should mention, because I did forget one thing, but I know Chris is going to talk about it, and that's the internet um, component of this, which is surprising, not surprisingly for us who live on Block Island and deal with it every day, but it's a huge part of this. So thank you. Like I said earlier, um, I was a proponent of, of uh, the wind farm for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, just my education and core beliefs, getting off of a million gallons of diesel to generate electricity on an island 10 square miles, for me was a plus. We have a kind of, you know, Block Island is very progressive in land conservation. Nearly 50% of the island is set aside in some type of preservation, which is for a community across America is, is rare. But on the flip side, our carbon footprint <laughs> was, was big um, when it came to generating electricity. So alternative energies, um, I've, I've always been a proponent of. Um, and the plus side to having consistent electricity, as Judy mentioned, was you know, you get down to your daily use of electrical appliances, you don't have brownouts, which we would have on a weekly basis, um, and your, our electric bill for the time being has dropped. So those, those are kind of the, the, the other plus side to it, um, to having the, the turbines. Um, Judy mentioned doing a lot of surveys. I don't remember doing a whole bunch. Again, this process started <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, I actually maybe did one survey. I went to two meetings that were directly related to fishing. Um, I think the, uh, the process on the island, if you wanted to be involved, you could be. Being a proponent of it, I wasn't terribly concerned. If you were against it, I could see being more active in participating in meetings. Does that make sense? If, you know, for, it's easier to complain about something than it is to, you know, uh, be an activist for it, so to speak. Um, the, the, disappoint, the disappointing, I mentioned earlier, there was a disappointing part of it was primarily when the town was negotiating with, Deepwater actually, I think, uh, did a great job on their end of it. I'm not so happy with National Grid because it's their substation on the island. Um, and the transparency I don't think was necessarily there. You know, we're, we're proposed, I think the initial proposal for the substation costs were somewhere around $330,000. Final price tag is 2.5 million. Um, that's gonna be borne by the ratepayers on Block Island. Um, <coughs> how you don't know that is beyond me. Um, and that was uh, uh, one of the biggest disappointments. Um, we were able to, the, the town was able to, in the cable, uh, you know, the, the mainland to the island cable, get fiber optic cable um, to the island. 
our internet service is horrific. Um, remember dial-up? It's like that. Our school is, is suffocating with the lack of broadband access, our police station, our medical center. So we got fiber optic to the island. Fantastic. Now it's sitting there because we didn't have a plan to do something with it once it got there. And we're in the process of doing that. Um, but hindsight's 2020. We could have started that process when we knew it was coming over four or five years ago. Um, then it, you know, it shows up on the doorstep, and then we're like, now what? And it would have been helpful to maybe leverage some of that a little more with the um, all the people involved in at least getting getting it to some critical spots are operational instead of um, sitting dormant right now. Um, and it's gonna be initial cost, six to, six to eight million dollars to get island-wide uh, fiber optic service. Um, so we're debating on what approach to take uh, with that right now. Um, Dave mentioned earlier the fishing perspective on it. He's right. It enhances uh, the user experience um, quite a bit. We had the pleasure of watching it being built, so all of our customers were intrigued. Um, part of that experience when you're out fishing, you know, catching fish is number three. When you have uh, something like the wind farm out there, it just adds it's another spot to go. It spreads our fleet out. Block Island <coughs> gets hammered in the summertime with recreational fishermen from four states, and including ours. And uh, when you, this is basically essentially five artificial reefs, um, finally. And uh, it's five more spots to fish. Um, so it increases the recreational um, experience when it comes to fishing. Um, I think that's about it right now. I'll give it to Judy. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Um, I guess, uh, you know, as a meteorologist and in a sort of a tree-hugging uh, environmentalist, I'm very, very strongly in favor of uh, renewable energy sources. Um, I, uh, I remember uh, Scott, or no, Dennis Nixon called me a yimby, a yes in my backyard, uh, because I, uh, uh, when it, if I, I feel like as a nation, if we're making a choice between renewable energy or fracking, there's just no choice. Um, if we're talking about putting up wind farms or violating the Alaska Rep Wildlife Refuge, there, there's just no choice in my mind. So I am a yimby. Uh, around the internet, um, there, when we knew it was coming and nobody stepped up, somebody had to create, has to create a business around that. And, and we knew it, but there, nobody stepped up. And so I think, uh, I think that's a real challenge. It was a challenge with the electric grid in the 1940s when, when finally somebody in the federal government decided that electricity was a common good. I think it's pretty well established now that internet access is a common good. It affects our education, affects our medical services, our fire rescue services, as Chris uh, so eloquently pointed out. I think it's very important for us to view internet access also as a, as a common good. Um, uh, Jessica talked about real estate values for the people who, uh, whose view sheds were impacted. Um, I assume that it hasn't impact, negatively impacted mine. I do overlook the wind farm. But I want to point out that uh, real estate values for the many more people who lived around those generators has probably gone up because you can't hear, I could also hear the generators. Uh, because I am on one of the higher points of the island. So now I can't hear the generators. I can only imagine the improvement in, uh, in noise pollution for the hundreds of homes that are around those generators versus the dozens of homes that over overlooking the wind farm. Um, I, I want uh, the, the cost of power, which I understand now isn't going to go down as much as I thought it was. Uh, I just, just, just to give you context, the August before the wind farm went online. I paid 52 cents per kilowatt hour. That's my per that was my personal bill. 
And when you go home and look at your bill, you're probably paying, if you're paying over 20 cents, I'd be surprised, maybe 22, 23. Um, 52 cents per kilowatt hour, you know, we turn off our lights when we leave the room. Um, we don't leave our computer plugged in at night. You know, I mean, there's, it, it's, uh, that's a lot of money. And, uh, and um, I think that we're, we will end up paying for the substation, I'm sorry to hear about that, um, uh, probably through our rate structure. And uh, so it, our bills probably won't go down, it won't be reflected in uh, lower energy costs right away, but I, hopefully in the long run, it, it, as your bills are going up, hopefully ours will be coming down. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I'm gonna shift it now. Um, I, I think we, I think you'd agree that Block Island's primary economic driver now on the island is tourism and recreation, right? And um, three of the four of you are involved in some way in tourism and recreation activities. Judy, I'm assuming you recreate, so I'll count well, you in I that group me, too. So yeah. <laughs> So I'd love to shift the conversation there and hear from each of you about what you see as the effects of the wind farm on tourism and recreation as an, as an economy um, and as, a, as an activity, money aside. Yeah, so um, putting my tourism council hat on, I, um, there was right, you know, one of the, I should say that, that the people who said this is going to affect our real estate prices, that was just one of their arguments because they didn't want the wind farm. Whether or not they knew that was to be true, you know, we had to wait to see. Just the same thing as I understand the Cape Wind project just died because, you know, it was a it was a NIMBY thing, you know, and people said, I don't want it in my backyard, and it, it's going to affect tourism. And uh, Maryland, maybe, the governor of Maryland just came out and said, well, we're going to put this project on hold because we're not sure of the effect on tourism, and people people come to the beach to go look at the ocean, not to look at turbines. So this has been super interesting for me because I've been able to follow along with it all that it's happening and to be sort of in on some of the preliminary studies. And it's very interesting to me that there's at least two or three major studies going on right now to study, to actually study the social impacts of tourism, of the wind farm on tourism, because tourism is a very, is not studied at all. With very, very limited studies on tourism. I mean, just listening to that last session on the birds and the bats, so there's, I mean, how many people studying, you know, that stuff? And it's just not something that's studied. It's a huge economy for the country, um, but it's, it's not something that's understood. So we can track birds migrating much easier than we can track humans, and they're migrating patterns. But that being said, it's now being studied. So we're starting to see the sort of preliminary results coming out. And I, I think Amelia is sitting on a, a panel and gonna, we'll talk about some of that social stuff that's coming out. But overall, from a tourism perspective, um, you know, people were really sort of up in arms about this, right? At the very end, it was sort of like a last ditch effort, I think, to throw a wrench in the plans, is it's gonna affect tourism. If anything, I think it's, I think it's affected tourism positively. Um, we've definitely seen more people on the island that have come just to see the wind farm. Um, we've had businesses sprout up on the island, um, boats taking people out to, um, to see uh, the wind farm. Um, if, you know, for every one person who said, I'm never stepping foot on that island again, there's probably 20 who said we are going just to see the wind farm. Um, and you know, you can definitely have the same experience you always had on Block Island, even though there's a wind farm there. The, the difference, again, I think is not to the tourist. I think it's to the resident who you know, has lived on, their Block Island, lived on Block Island their whole life or the last 20 years and has lost their dark sky or has, has lost that sort of intangible, and I've, I've talked about this before um, in, in this sort of um, arena where it, you can't, you know, you can't study it. You can't study people's feelings, and, but, but nobody's gonna not come to Block Island to enjoy our amazing island, our beaches, and our, you know, conservation, and our restaurants, and our shopping, and our dining, you know, all, all that stuff that's so awesome about, nobody's not gonna come because there is, you know, a, five turbines in, in a viewshed off Southeast Light. So 
you know, it, if anything, it's been a positive, and I think should the um, electric rates go down, continue to go down, that will help um, prices on the island, which is a big deal. Obviously, it's not, um, it's pretty expensive to go to Block Island, stay on Block Island. Now you can maybe have a room with air conditioning. A lot more places are putting in air conditioning now um, because not only is it a, going to be or is at least more affordable, it's they're not gonna burn out every you know couple months. So there's a lot of secondary effects, tourism-wise, that will come of this. Um, never mind the fact that from a marketing perspective, it gives us as a tourism council another, um, another way to market Block Island. And we've always, we talked about Block Island being green, um, how we conserve so much land and, you know, our transfer station and all, all this stuff. So we, you know, this is just another thing to talk about, another reason to love Block Island. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely a positive uh, on a, from a tourism perspective, um, more than a negative. But I can't wait to see the results of all the studies. As Jess said, it is another, from a, um, a business perspective um, for a charter boat captain, you know, it's another marketing strategy you can employ having the first um, wind farm in, de in water, in, in offshore wind farm in America. Now, so we do advertise, um, you know, wind farm tours. We do incorporate it into our, our fishing trips. There has been, um, you, in, in the charter boat industry, you get longevity when you diversify. You can't always rely on mother nature, um, as we all know. Sometimes the fishing stinks, and you can, now you can just say, all right, let's go look at, you know, this engineering marvel three miles from the island, um, <laughs> is divert their attention to that. Um, overall, I, w we have seen an uptick in, in requests to go, go view the wind farm, but most of the time it's just an added uh, benefit to the trip. There has been a few operations on the island, existing operations that now have uh, tried to diversify into doing wind farm tours. Some have been successful, some not. Um, I think the most success has been had by the Block Island Ferry who started off doing a couple of wind farm tours on their, their fast ferry, and I think they're up to five or six a summer. They're usually sold out. It's, um, it's inexpensive, um, and it's uh, educational. Um, I think communities that, I think our community, community can do, a, on a tourism perspective, do a better job with the educational component, having something downtown somewhere dedicated just to the wind farm and its and, and the process behind it and that I think would be a, a plus. Um, we don't really have that now, um, but if you know I, in town hall there's a cross section of the cable that goes from the wind farm to the island to the mainland. I mean, it's impressive. Um, and it gives you uh, an idea of, of, without even seeing the wind farm, what went into getting this done. <coughs> so when you, you, know, you, 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 you look at tourism on the island, I think there, there has been an uptick. Obviously, there's been an uptick if the, if the ferry companies are doing you know, more and more tours every summer. Um, and it, I don't think it has affected, uh, we get a lot of weekly house rentals. The bulk of our clientele are spending a week or more on the island. And I have not heard any negative from any of our customers about the wind farm, it being ugly or detracting from the attraction of Block Island. Quite the opposite. If you don't like the outdoors and nature, you're not coming to Block Island. <coughs> That's just a fact. Um, the only negative I've ever heard about visitors on Block Island literally has been in the past five years, internet service. 
people can't. People will spend more time on Block Island if they can work on Block Island, particularly in the summertime. So when we crack that nut, then we'll be even in better shape, I think. To, to questions from the audience shortly, but one of the things I had asked you all to do was to think about you know, lessons learned or advice <laughs> that you would pay forward um, to others. There's many in the room here who are um, involved in planning for and potentially citing future wind farms. So I'd love to go down the line or however you want to do it. If you could each briefly state, keep it like you know, 30 seconds, briefly state one piece of advice or lesson learned you'd pass forward. Dave, you look like you want to go. Sure. Sure, I'd love to, and, and this sort of relates to what um, Aileen had mentioned uh, before to the scientists that were here. Uh, as a fishing journalist writing about the wind farm, I'm always anxious to learn about uh, the science that has been done. Uh, as a fisherman and uh, sort of a leader in the recreational fishing community, I constantly get questions. There are so many myths. Uh, Jeff uh, opened up the session talking about the whale dying because of the windmills, that sort of thing. Well, we heard an angler who um, uh, 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 does surf casting from the shore of Block Island mm -hmm. saying that the uh, striped bass bite was no good because of the wind farms this year. So these are, these are all myths that I think that can be dispelled by just communicating the research that we have. The research that uh, Kevin has done at uh, UMass that uh, uh, John King has done, um, at Miller and Potty and Kali and all the people we heard today is great research and there's very little understanding uh, in, the, in the community, in the, in the fishing community and in the community in general about, um, uh, uh, about the research in general and its findings. And I think that it's important to accumulate that research and publish it. And one of the best ways that I could think, and I don't know if John King is here today, maybe he's not, but um, the thing I can equate it to is uh, there's something called the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program. They recently came out a report with a report on the health of Narragansett Bay. And John was the lead scientist leading a dozen uh, scientists on an advisory panel uh, and what they did is there were maybe 20 or 30 studies done on Narragansett Bay about uh, nutrient loads from the sewage treatment plants, the impact of climate change. There were 20 different studies. And this report accumulated all those studies and said, here's the state of Narragansett Bay. This is the second time that it was done. It was extremely impactful. And I almost suggest something like that uh, be done in regard to wind energy. And it could be housed under something called uh, you know, um, um, you know, Ocean Winds uh, Center, or so, you know, it could be developer funded, but not one developer, uh, and all the information flow through it, and there's a state of wind farms on the, on the coast that actually uh, gets published uh, and, and is updated maybe every two years, every three years, every year, I'm not quite sure, so. Um, okay, so uh, from a community perspective, I think one of uh, a couple of the things that Deepwater Wind did very well was um, uh, the number. I, I remember lots of surveys. Sorry, you guys, but uh, <laughs> maybe because I was just longing to be connected to Block Island. When I was living in Miami, but uh, uh, but this, this, uh, the surveys included photos of what it was going to look like. And I thought that was really impactful. Um, so lots of meetings, lots of surveys with photos of, of impacted citizens as well as businesses. I think that uh, Deepwater Wind did a great job at that, uh, for their piece of that puzzle. I think they also spent quite a bit of money in the community. They built a lot of goodwill that way. And I thought one of the most important things they did uh, from my perspective was they hired Brian Wilson. Brian is a known quantity on the island. He'd lived there for several years. He's raising his family there. He has a vested interest in the health and welfare of the community. And he became um, a, a really good nexus for information flow and for um, building goodwill on Block Island. Uh, and, and I think that they, that was a really important step that they took. Um, considering the number of organizations that are involved in this project, I think getting a consistency with information outflow is paramount. Um, 
I mean, there are there's so many organizations that are affiliated in some way, shape, or form with this with this project, um, and I I agree. Having an on island deep water did the right thing. Having somebody on island with Brian, um, which is which was smart, and any community thinking about doing this has to go local. Um, Deepwater's hired local boats to do work, um, and uh, those were all those are all good things. That's that's Deepwater. Then you you can you can pick and choose what organization and give them a grade. I would just say that the, the consistency and the information outflow um, has to be there, um, and uh, and and making it available not in academia format. <laughs> you have to dumb it down, um, it, so to speak. Um, and I think uh, I think the engagement. Um, I can't speak to the engagement uh, at the at the state level as uh, uh, as far as um, the mainland, as we call it. Um, but there are plenty and plenty of meetings to to go to, but we live in a day and age of social media and electronic information. Um, make all that information available to anybody that doesn't want to go to a meeting. Um, you're only going to improve your your um, your data collection, if you would, um, if you utilize everything available, um, not just you know your your typical town hall meeting um so like moving forward with with projects down the line i think consistency of information gathering using everything possible to do that as well as um consistency in getting the information out and i say consistency <clears throat> between all these organizations you're not going to necessarily get one consistent message but at least get the information out there in a timely fashion and don't have it contradict um, what another agency is might be saying or doing. Um, and I don't know, have any suggestions on how to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I think that that's important in, uh, in moving forward with, with, uh, with projects like this. Uh, I my my suggestion would be to bring tourism into the conversation earlier and more. Um, I feel like tourism is the number one economy on Block Island. Um, I feel like when the when the site selection process was going on, um, they looked at they looked at bird migration, whale migration, um, shipping lanes. Uh, they mapped the ocean floor. They looked at where the wind was going to be best, and you know, and, and picked the best spot to to make the most efficient wind farm. Um, I don't feel like the tourism was ever taken into effect. My guess is that if there were two spots that were equally good, all everything being equal, obviously would have picked the one that had less impact on tourism instead of placing the wind farm in the number one most visited tourism location on Block Island. So I think that bringing tourism into the conversation early on, I don't feel like we were in this situation. I think um, none of the members of the Tourism Council, there's a seven member board, feel that they were brought in um, early on. Um, I think is important for any developer going forward, any town to get involved with, with the chambers and the businesses and the, the tourism community. Um, and I think a way to do that is gonna be to support and follow the current social studies that are out there and, and really follow up because I think they're gonna turn out to be very positive for developers moving forward. So when some governor or some a butter or somebody says this is going to destroy tourism in this area. You're going to have proof now, and you know scientific, you know educational proof to say no. Actually, this is what we think is going to happen. So I think that's going to be really important moving forward. Thank you. Um, I now have to open it up to our panelists, or to our, to our audience. Uh, what questions do we have for our panelists? Go ahead, John.
Well, the, the commercial fishing uh, fishing community is much smaller. I mean, you want to get you just go right to yeah. You go right to Point Judith. Recreational, you're looking at four states when it comes to this specific wind farm, um, and organizations. You know, Dave mentioned he's vice president of Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers Association. That's that's a start. Um, um, I think you're going to have you know you have the recreational arena. Um, you, if you want to accumulate data, is again you're gonna have to I think go to organizations like around saltwater anglers, but also go hit social media quite a bit. Um, and there's a how many how many clubs are in the state, Dave? Um, the uh, Rhode Island saltwater anglers has about 30 affiliated clubs, and those clubs Check. are interstate. Like yeah. there, there, Connecticut, there's Mass, Connecticut, Mass. And, and so Rhode that's yeah. that would be an obvious um, um, choice to to start the process. And then Long Island, if you if you know, I think they're proposing one off of Long Island. Obviously, the the am I right? No, I'm sorry. The Montauk one. That's six. That's that's actually they're saying closer it's to less than it is the Montauk. Island, but. <laughs> um, so that and that would be my suggestion is go to the start at at organizations like that um, just because of the the sheer number of people that you're talking about and you're talking about different you're talking about surf casters and then and then boat fishermen that's two totally different demographics and you could throw in fly fishing and that's a whole different you know demographic and these clubs typically encompass all of them um, just uh, very quickly. Um the Block Island uh, wind farm area has a lot of recreational fishing. As you move to some of the other areas, like, like the Cox uh, Ledge uh, proposed website, um, as uh, my charter brother, uh, Rick Bellavance, would say, um, Cox Ledge is very much uh, to recreational fishermen, like George's Bank is to commercial fishermen. Cox Ledge is um, filled with an abundance of species that recreational anglers, private recreational anglers and charter boats target. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, uh, uh, sharks, uh, bluefin, yellowfin tuner, codfish, uh, sea bass. It goes on and on and on. And um, so I think recreational uh, fishing is, uh, should even play a, a, a major, more of a role in some of the wind farms that are going to be developed. But just to take the concept of the Ocean Wind Farm Center, filtering all the research together and coming out with a report uh, fairly regularly of the state of their, the different wind farms. I also think that that entity could take a leadership role in communicating uh, uh, with constituents uh, in, in the research. And as Chris said, that would be uh, a boots on the ground thing through organizations like the Rhode Island Saltwater Angles, which is really a Southern New England group, but uh, so there should be an actual campaign to communicate wh where wind farms are. Uh, and we can chat later about your, sp your specific one, but I think there's an abundance of information right now that the public in general should, should know, and I think that can be effectively communicated uh, to, to everyone. I, I actually, I have an idea, it, and this is way out of my area of expertise. So I used to attend something called Fish Expo. Do they still do those? Oh, yeah. and, but, but go to boat go to the boat shows. I mean, tons of recreational boaters at the boat shows set up a booth and talk about the wind farms. I bet you'd be really busy. <laughs> the, uh, the Saltwater Anglers has something called the um, New England uh, Recreational Fishing Show. It's the largest uh, fishing show uh, in, in New England. It happens at the convention center. And we often uh, give uh, uh, and donate booths to nonprofits, and we rent booths to um, others as well. Social media, yes. Yeah, so, uh, recreational angles, social media is key. Everyone wants to know where the bite is, so to speak. Uh, and so um, uh, social media is used uh, uh, often by recreational anglers. So that would be a good avenue, yep. Great, we have a little less time than I thought, but if there's one more burning question, we can take it. And if not, at least a couple of our folks I think should still be available to chat over lunch. Any other burning questions? Well, thank you all for your attention and let, join me in applauding our panel.
And now we break for lunch. And we return at 1.15.